at the Painted Veil. Author, W. Somerset Mom. Chapter 1. She gave a startled cry. What's the matter? he asked. Notwithstanding the darkness of the shuttered room, he saw her face on a sudden distraught with terror. Someone just tried the door. Well, perhaps it was the Emma, or one of the boys. They never come at this time. They know I always sleep after Tiffin. Who else could it be? Walter, she whispered, her lips trembling. She pointed to his shoes. He tried to put them on. But his nervousness, for her alarm was affecting him, made him clumsy, and besides, they were on the tight side. With a faint gasp of impatience she gave him a shoehorn. She slipped into a kimono and in her bare feet went over to her dressing table. Her hair was shingled and with a comb she had repaired its disorder before he had laced his second shoe. She handed him his coat. How shall I get out? You'd better wait a bit. I'll look out and see that it's all right. It can't possibly be Walter. He doesn't leave the laboratory till five. Who is it then? They spoke in whispers now. She was quaking. It occurred to him that in an emergency she would lose her head and on a sudden he felt angry with her. If it wasn't safe why the devil had she said it was? She caught her breath and put her hand on his arm. He followed the direction of her glance. They stood facing the windows that led out on the veranda. They were shuttered and the shutters were bolted. They saw the white china knob of the handle slowly turn. They had heard no one walk along the veranda. It was terrifying to see that silent motion. A minute passed and there was no sound. Then, with the ghastliness of the supernatural. In the same stealthy, noiseless and horrifying manner, they saw the white china knob of the handle at the other window turn also. It was so frightening that Kitty, her nerves failing her, opened her mouth to scream, but, seeing what she was going to do, he swiftly put his hand over it and her cry was smothered in his fingers. Silence. She leaned against him, her knees shaking, and he was afraid she would faint. Frowning, his jaw set, he carried her to the bed and sat her down upon it. She was as white as the sheet and notwithstanding his tan his cheeks were pale too. He stood by her side looking with fascinated gaze at the china knob. They did not speak. Then he saw that she was crying. For God's sake don't do that, he whispered irritably. If we're in for it we're in for it. We shall just have to brazen it out. She looked for her handkerchief and knowing what she wanted he gave her bag. Where's your topi? I left it downstairs. Oh, my God, I say, you must pull yourself together. It's a hundred to one it wasn't Walter. Why on earth should he come back at this hour? He never does come home in the middle of the day, does he? Never. I'll bet you anything you like it was the Emma. She gave him the shadow of a smile. His rich, caressing voice reassured her and she took his hand and affectionately pressed it. He gave her a moment to collect herself. Look here, we can't stay here forever, he said then. Do you feel up to going out on the veranda and having a look? 
I don't think I can stand. Have you got any brandy in here? She shook her head. A frown for an instant darkened his brow. He was growing impatient. He did not quite know what to do. Suddenly she clutched his hand more tightly. Suppose he's waiting there? He forced his lips to smile and his voice retained the gentle, persuasive tone the effect of which he was so fully conscious of. That's not very likely. Have a little pluck, Kitty. How can it possibly be your husband? If he'd come in and seen a strange topee in the hall, and come upstairs and found your room locked, surely he would have made some sort of row. It must have been one of the servants. Only a Chinese would turn a handle in that way. She did feel more herself now. It's not very pleasant, even if it was only the Amma. She can be squared, and if necessary, I'll put the fear of God into her. There are not many advantages in being a government official, but you may as well get what you can out of it. He must be right. She stood up and turning to him stretched out her arms. He took her in his and kissed her on the lips. It was such rapture that it was pain. She adored him. He released her, and she went to the window. She slid back the bolt and opening the shutter a little looked out. There was not a soul. She slipped onto the veranda, looked into her husband's dressing room, and then into her own sitting room. Both were empty. She went back to the bedroom and beckoned to him. Nobody. I believe the whole thing was an optical delusion. Don't laugh. I was terrified. Go into my sitting room and sit down. I'll put on my stockings and some shoes. Underscore two underscore. He did as she bade, and in five minutes she joined him. He was smoking a cigarette. I say, could I have a brandy and soda? Yes, I'll ring. I don't think it would hurt underscore you underscore by the look of things. They waited in silence for the boy to answer. She gave the order. Ring up the laboratory and ask if Walter is there, she said then. They won't know your voice. He took up the receiver and asked for the number. He inquired whether Dr. Fain was in. He put down the receiver. He hasn't been in since Tiffin, he told her. Ask the boy whether he has been here. I daren't. It'll look so funny if he has and I didn't see him. The boy brought the drinks and Townsend helped himself. When he offered her some she shook her head. What's to be done if it was Walter, she asked. Perhaps he wouldn't care. Walter? Her tone was incredulous. It's always struck me he was rather shy. Some men can't bear scenes, you know. He's got sense enough to know that there's nothing to be gained by making a scandal. I don't believe for a minute it was Walter, but even if it was my impression is that he'll do nothing. I think he'll ignore it. She reflected for a moment. He's awfully in love with me. Well, that's all to the good. You'll get round him. He gave her that charming smile of his which she had always found so irresistible. It was a slow smile which started in his clear blue eyes and traveled by perceptible degrees to his shapely mouth. He had small white even teeth. 
It was a very sensual smile, and it made her heart melt in her body. I don't very much care, she said, with a flash of gaiety. It was worth it. It was my fault. Why did you come? I was amazed to see you. I couldn't resist it. You dear. She leaned a little towards him, her dark and shining eyes gazing passionately into his, her mouth a little open with desire, and he put his arms round her. She abandoned herself with a sigh of ecstasy to their shelter. You know you can always count on me, he said. I'm so happy with you. I wish I could make you as happy as you make me. You're not frightened anymore? I hate Walter, she answered. He did not quite know what to say to this, so he kissed her. Her face was very soft against his. But he took her wrist on which was a little gold watch and looked at the time. Do you know what I must do now? Bolt, she smiled. He nodded. For one instant she clung to him more closely. But she felt his desire to go, and she released him. It's shameful the way you neglect your work. Be off with you. He could never resist the temptation to flirt. You seem in a devil of a hurry to get rid of me, he said lightly. You know that I hate to let you go. Her answer was low and deep and serious. He gave a flattered laugh. Don't worry your pretty little head about our mysterious visitor. I'm quite sure it was the Amma. And if there's any trouble I guarantee to get you out of it. Have you had a lot of experience? His smile was amused and complacent. No, but I flatter myself that I've got a head screwed on my shoulders. Underscore three underscore she went out onto the veranda and watched him leave the house. He waved his hand to her. It gave her a little thrill as she looked at him. He was 41, but he had the lithe figure and the springing step of a boy. The veranda was in shadow and lazily. Her heart at ease with satisfied love, she lingered. Their house stood in the pleasant vale, on the side of the hill. For they could not afford to live on the more eligible but expensive mount. But her abstracted gaze scarcely noticed the blue sea and the crowded shipping in the harbor. She could think only of her lover. Of course it was stupid to behave as they had done that afternoon, but if he wanted her how could she be prudent? He had come two or three times after Tiffin, when in the heat of the day no one thought of stirring out, and not even the boys had seen him come and go. It was very difficult at Qingyan. She hated the Chinese city, and it made her nervous to go into the filthy little house off the Victoria Road in which they were in the habit of meeting. It was a curio dealer's and the Chinese who were sitting about stared at her unpleasantly. She hated the ingratiating smile of the old man who took her to the back of the shop and then up a dark flight of stairs. The room into which he led her was frozy and the large wooden bed against the wall made her shudder. This is dreadfully sordid, isn't it? She said to Charlie the first time she met him there. It was till you came in, he answered. Of course the moment he took her in his arms she forgot everything. Oh! How hateful it was that she wasn't free, that they both weren't free. She didn't like his wife. Kitty's wandering thoughts dwelt now for a moment on Dorothy Townsend. How unfortunate to be called Dorothy! It dated you. 
she was 38 at least. But Charlie never spoke of her. Of course he didn't care for her, she bored him to death. But he was a gentleman. Kitty smiled with affectionate irony, it was just like him, silly old thing, he might be unfaithful to her. But he would never allow a word in disparagement of her to cross his lips. She was a tallish woman, taller than Kitty, neither stout nor thin, with a good deal of pale brown hair. She could never have been pretty with anything but the prettiness of youth. Her features were good enough without being remarkable and her blue eyes were cold. She had a skin that you would never look at twice and no color in her cheeks. And she dressed like well, like what she was, the wife of the assistant colonial secretary at Ching Yen. Kitty smiled and gave her shoulders a faint shrug. Of course no one could deny that Dorothy Townsend had a pleasant voice. She was a wonderful mother, Charlie always said that of her. And she was what Kitty's mother called a gentlewoman. But Kitty did not like her. She did not like her casual manner, and the politeness with which she treated you when you went there. To tea or dinner, was exasperating because you could not but feel how little interest she took in you. The fact was, Kitty supposed that she cared for nothing but her children. There were two boys at school in England, and another boy of six whom she was going to take home next year. Her face was a mask. She smiled and in her pleasant, well-mannered way said the things that were expected of her, but for all her cordiality held you at a distance. She had a few intimate friends in the colony, and they greatly admired her. Kitty wondered whether Mrs. Townsend bought her a little common. She flushed. After all there was no reason for her to put on airs. It was true that her father had been a colonial governor and of course it was very grand while it lasted everyone stood up when you entered a room and men took off their hats to you as you passed in your car but what could be more insignificant than a colonial governor when he had retired? Dorothy Townsend's father lived on a pension in a small house at Earl's Court. Kitty's mother would think it a dreadful bore if she asked her to call. Kitty's father, Bernard Garston, was a K.C. And there was no reason why he should not be made a judge one of these days. Anyhow they lived in South Kensington, underscore four underscore Kitty, coming to Ching in on her marriage had found it hard to reconcile herself to the fact that her social position was determined by her husband's occupation. Of course everyone had been very kind and for two or three months they had gone out to parties almost every night. When they dined at Government House the governor took her in as a bride. But she had understood quickly that, as the wife of the government bacteriologist, she was of no particular consequence. It made her angry. It's too absurd, she told her husband. Why? There's hardly anyone here that one would bother about for five minutes at home. Mother wouldn't dream of asking any of them to dine at our house. You mustn't let it worry you, he answered. It doesn't really matter, you know. Of course it doesn't matter, it only shows how stupid they are. But it is rather funny when you think of all the people who used to come to our house at home that here we should be treated like dirt. From a social standpoint the man of science does not exist, he smiled. She knew that now, but she had not known it when she married him. I don't know that it exactly amuses me to be taken in to dinner by the agent of the P, 
and oh, she said, laughing in order that what she said might not seem snobbish. Perhaps he saw the reproach behind her lightness of manner, for he took her hand and shyly pressed it. I'm awfully sorry, Kitty dear, but don't let it vex you. Oh, I'm not going to let it do that. Underscore V underscore. It couldn't have been Walter that afternoon. It must have been one of the servants, and after all they didn't matter. Chinese servants knew everything anyway. But they held their tongues. Her heart beat a little faster as she remembered the way in which that white china knob slowly turned. They mustn't take risks like that again. It was better to go to the curio shop. No one who saw her go in would think anything of it, and they were absolutely safe there. The owner of the shop knew who Charlie was, and he was not such a fool as to put up the back of the assistant colonial secretary. What did anything matter really but that Charlie loved her? She turned away from the veranda and went back into her sitting room. She threw herself down on the sofa and stretched out her hand to get a cigarette. Her eye caught sight of a note lying on the top of a book. She opened it. It was written in pencil, underscore dear kitty, underscore comma, underscore here is the book you wanted. I was just going to send it when I met Dr. Fane and he said he'd bring it round himself as he was passing the house, underscore underscore v dot h underscore she rang the bell and when the boy came asked him who had brought the book and when master bring it missy after tiffin he answered then it had been walter she rang up the colonial secretary's office at once and asked for charlie she told him what she had just learned there was a pause before he answered what shall I do? she asked. I'm in the middle of an important consultation. I'm afraid I can't talk to you now. My advice to you is to sit tight. She put down the receiver. She understood that he was not alone and she was impatient with his business. She sat down again at a desk and resting her face in her hands sought to think out the situation. Of course Walter might merely have thought she was sleeping, there was no reason why she should not lock herself in. She tried to remember if they had been talking. Certainly they had not been talking loud. And there was the hat. It was maddening of Charlie to have left it downstairs. But it was no use blaming him for that, it was natural enough, and there was nothing to tell that Walter had noticed it. He was probably in a hurry, and had just left the book and the note on his way to some appointment connected with his work. The strange thing was that he should have tried the door, and then the two windows. If he thought she was asleep it was unlike him to disturb her. What a fool she had been. She shook herself a little and again she felt that sweet pain in her heart which she always felt when she thought of Charlie. It had been worth it. He had said that he would stand by her. And if the worst came to the worst, well, let Walter kick up a row if he chose. She had Charlie, what did she care? Perhaps it would be the best thing for him to know. She had never cared for Walter, and since she had loved Charlie Townsend it had irked and bored her to submit to her husband's caresses. She wanted to have nothing more to do with him. She didn't see how he could prove anything. If he accused her she would deny, 
and if it came to pass that she could deny no longer, well, she would fling the truth in his teeth. And he could do what he chose, underscore six underscore within three months of her marriage she knew that she had made a mistake, but it had been her mother's fault even more than hers. There was a photograph of her mother in the room and Kitty's harassed eyes fell on it. She did not know why she kept it there, for she was not very fond of her mother. There was one of her father too, but that was downstairs on the grand piano. It had been done when he took silk and it represented him in wig and gown. Even they could not make him imposing. He was a little, wizened man, with tired eyes, a long upper lip, and a thin mouth. A facetious photographer had told him to look pleasant, but he had succeeded only in looking severe. It was on this account, for as a rule the downturned corners of his mouth and the dejection of his eyes gave him an air of mild depression, that Mrs. Garston, thinking it made him look judicial, had chosen it from among the proofs. But her own photograph showed her in the dress in which she had gone to court when her husband was made a king's counsel. She was very grand in the velvet gown. The long train so disposed as to show to advantage, with feathers in her hair and flowers in her hand. She held herself erect. She was a woman of fifty, thin and flat-chested, with prominent cheekbones and a large, well-shaped nose. She had a great quantity of very smooth black hair and Kitty had always suspected that, if not dyed, it was at least touched up. Her fine black eyes were never still and this was the most noticeable thing about her, for when she was talking to you it was disconcerting to see those restless eyes in that impassive, unlined and yellow face. They moved from one part of you to another, to other persons in the room, and then back to you, you felt that she was criticizing you, summing you up. Watchful meanwhile of all that went on around her, and that the words she spoke had no connection with her thoughts, underscore seven underscore Mrs. Garston was a hard, cruel, managing, ambitious, parsimonious, and stupid woman. She was the daughter, one of five, of a solicitor in Liverpool and Bernard Garston had met her when he was on the Northern Circuit. He had seemed then a young man of promise and her father said he would go far. He hadn't. He was painstaking, industrious and capable, but he had not the will to advance himself. Mrs. Garston despised him. But she recognized, though with bitterness, that she could only achieve success through him and she set herself to drive him on the way she desired to go. She nagged him without mercy. She discovered that if she wanted him to do something which his sensitiveness revolted against she had only to give him no peace and eventually. Exhausted, he would yield. On her side she set herself to cultivate the people who might be useful. She flattered the solicitors who would send her husband briefs and was familiar with their wives. She was obsequious to the judges and their ladies. She made much of promising politicians. In 25 years Mrs. Garston never invited anyone to dine at her house because she liked him. She gave large dinner parties at regular intervals but parsimony was as strong in her as ambition. She hated to spend money. She flattered herself that she could make as much show as anyone else at half the price. Her dinners were long and elaborate, but thrifty. And she could never persuade herself that people when they were eating and talking knew what they drank. 
She wrapped sparkling Moselle in a napkin and thought her guests took it for champagne. Bernard Garston had a fair, though not a large practice. Men who had been called after him had long outstripped him. Mrs. Garston made him stand for Parliament. The expense of the election was borne by the party. But here again her parsimony balked her ambition, and she could not bring herself to spend enough money to nurse the constituency. The subscriptions Bernard Garston made to the innumerable funds a candidate is expected to contribute to were always just a little less than adequate. He was beaten. Though it would have pleased Mrs. Garston to be a member's wife she bore her disappointment with fortitude. The fact of her husband's standing had brought her in contact with a number of prominent persons and she appreciated the addition to her social consequence. She knew that Bernard would never make his mark in the house. She wanted him to be a member only that he might have a claim on the gratitude of his party and surely to fight two or three losing seats would give him that. But he was still a junior and many younger men than he had already taken silk. It was necessary that he should too, not only because otherwise he could scarcely hope to be made a judge, but on her account also, it mortified her to go in to dinner after women ten years younger than herself. But here she encountered in her husband an obstinacy which she had not for years been accustomed to. He was afraid that as a Casey he would get no work. A bird in the hand was worth two in the bush, he told her, to which she retorted that a proverb was the last refuge of the mentally destitute. He suggested to her the possibility that his income would be halved, and he knew that there was no argument which could have greater weight with her. She would not listen. She called him pusillanimous. She gave him no peace and at last, as always, he yielded. He applied for silk and it was promptly awarded him. His misgivings were justified. He made no headway as a leader and his briefs were few. But he concealed any disappointment he may have felt, and if he reproached his wife it was in his heart. He grew perhaps a little more silent, but he had always been silent at home, and no one in his family noticed a change in him. His daughters had never looked upon him as anything but a source of income. It had always seemed perfectly natural that he should lead a dog's life in order to provide them with board and lodging, clothes, holiday and money for odds and ends, and now, understanding that through his fault money was less plentiful, the indifference they had felt for him was tinged with an exasperated contempt. It never occurred to them to ask themselves what were the feelings of the subdued little man who went out early in the morning and came home at night only in time to dress for dinner. He was a stranger to them, but because he was their father they took it for granted that he should love and cherish them, underscore eight underscore, but there was a quality of courage in Mrs. Garston which in itself was admirable. She let no one in her immediate circle, which to her was the world, see how mortified she was by the frustration of her hopes. She made no change in her style of living. By careful management she was able to give as showy dinners as she had done before. And she met her friends with the same bright gaiety which she had so long cultivated. She had a hard and facile fund of chit-chat, which in the society she moved and passed for conversation. She was a useful guest among persons to whom small talk did not come easily. 
for she was never at a loss with a new topic and could be trusted immediately to break an awkward silence with a suitable observation. It was unlikely now that Bernard Garston would ever be made a judge of the high court, but he might still hope for a county court judgeship or at the worst an appointment in the colonies. Meanwhile she had the satisfaction of seeing him appointed recorder of a Welsh town. But it was on her daughters that she set her hopes. By arranging good marriages for them she expected to make up for all the disappointments of her career. There were two, Kitty and Doris. Doris gave no sign of good looks. Her nose was too long and her figure was lumpy, so that Mrs. Garston could hope no more for her than that she should marry a young man who was well off and in a suitable profession. But Kitty was a beauty. She gave promise of being so when she was still a child, for she had large, dark eyes, liquid and vivacious, brown, curling hair in which there was a reddish tint, exquisite teeth and a lovely skin. Her features would never be very good, for her chin was too square and her nose, though not so long as Doris's, too big. Her beauty depended a good deal on her youth, and Mrs. Garston realized that she must marry in the first flush of her maidenhood. When she came out she was dazzling. Her skin was still her greatest beauty, but her eyes with their long lashes were so starry and yet so melting that it gave you a catch at the heart to look into them. She had a charming gaiety and the desire to please. Mrs. Garston bestowed upon her all the affection, a harsh, competent, calculating affection, of which she was capable. She dreamed ambitious dreams. It was not a good marriage she aimed at for her daughter, but a brilliant one. Kitty had been brought up with the knowledge that she was going to be a beautiful woman and she more than suspected her mother's ambition. It accorded with her own desires. She was launched upon the world and Mrs. Garston performed prodigies in getting herself invited to dances where her daughter might meet eligible men. Kitty was a success. She was amusing as well as beautiful, and very soon she had a dozen men in love with her. But none was suitable, and Kitty, charming and friendly with all, took care to commit herself with none. The drawing room in South Kensington was filled on Sunday afternoons with amorous youth, but Mrs. Garston observed, with a grim smile of approval, that it needed no effort on her part to keep them at a distance from Kitty. Kitty was prepared to flirt with them, and it diverted her to play one off against the other. But when they proposed to her, as none failed to do, she refused them with tact but decision. Her first season passed without the perfect suitor presenting himself, and the second also. But she was young and could afford to wait. Mrs. Garston told her friends that she thought it a pity for a girl to marry till she was twenty-one. But a third year passed and then a fourth. Two or three of her old admirers proposed again, but they were still penniless. One or two boys younger than herself proposed, a retired Indian civilian, a KCIE did the same. He was 53. Kitty still danced a great deal. She went to Wimbledon and Lords, to Ascot and Henley. She was thoroughly enjoying herself. But still no one whose position and income were satisfactory asked her to marry him. Mrs. Garston began to grow uneasy. She noticed that Kitty was beginning to attract men of forty and over. 
She reminded her that she would not be any longer so pretty in a year or two, and that young girls were coming out all the time. Mrs. Garston did not mince her words in the domestic circle, and she warned her daughter tartly that she would miss her market. Kitty shrugged her shoulders. She thought herself as pretty as ever, prettier perhaps, for she had learned how to dress in the last four years, and she had plenty of time. If she wanted to marry just to be married there were a dozen boys who would jump at the chance. Surely the right man would come along sooner or later. But Mrs. Garston judged the situation more shrewdly, with anger in her heart for the beautiful daughter who had missed her chances she set her standard a little lower. She turned back to the professional class at which she had sneered in her pride and looked about for a young lawyer or a businessman whose future inspired her with confidence. Kitty reached the age of 25 and was still unmarried. Mrs. Garston was exasperated and she did not hesitate often to give Kitty a piece of her very unpleasant mind. She asked her how much longer she expected her father to support her. He had spent sums he could ill afford in order to give her a chance and she had not taken it. It never struck Mrs. Garston that perhaps her own hard affability had frightened the men, sons of wealthy fathers or heirs to a title, whose visits she had too cordially encouraged. She put down Kitty's failure to stupidity. Then Doris came out. She had a long nose still, and a poor figure, and she danced badly. In her first season she became engaged to Geoffrey Dennison. He was the only son of a prosperous surgeon who had been given a baronetcy during the war. Geoffrey would inherit a title it is not very grand to be a medical baronet, but a title, thank God, is still a title and a very comfortable fortune. Kitty in a panic married Walter Fane, underscore nine underscore. She had known him but a little while and had never taken much notice of him. She had no idea when or where they had first met till after their engagement he told her that it was at a dance to which some friends had brought him. She certainly paid no attention to him then, and if she danced with him it was because she was good-natured and was glad to dance with anyone who asked her. She didn't know him from Adam when a day or two later at another dance he came up and spoke to her. Then she remarked that he was at every dance she went to. You know, I've danced with you at least a dozen times now and you must tell me your name, she said to him at last in her laughing way. He was obviously taken aback. Do you mean to say you don't know it? I was introduced to you. Oh, but people always mumble. I shouldn't be at all surprised if you hadn't the ghost of an idea what mine was. He smiled at her. His face was grace and a trifle stern. But his smile was very sweet. Of course I know it. He was silent for a moment or two. Have you no curiosity? he asked then. As much as most women. It didn't occur to you to ask somebody or other what my name was? She was faintly amused. She wondered why he thought it could in the least interest her, but she liked to please. So she looked at him with that dazzling smile of hers, and her beautiful eyes, dewy ponds under forest trees, held an enchanting kindness. Well, what is it? Walter Fane. She did not know why he came to dances, he did not dance very well, and he seemed to know few people. 
She had a passing thought that he was in love with her. But she dismissed it with a shrug of the shoulders. She had known girls who thought every man they met was in love with them and had always found them absurd. But she gave Walter Fane just a little more of her attention. He certainly did not behave like any of the other youths who had been in love with her. Most of them told her so frankly and wanted to kiss her, a good many did. But Walter Fane never talked of her and very little of himself. He was rather silent. She did not mind that because she had plenty to say and it pleased her to see him laugh when she made a facetious remark, but when he talked it was not stupidly. He was evidently shy. It appeared that he lived in the East and was home on leave. One Sunday afternoon he appeared at their house in South Kensington. There were a dozen people there, and he sat for some time, somewhat ill at ease, and then went away. Her mother asked her later who he was. I haven't a notion. Did you ask him to come here? Yes, I met him at the Baddeleys. He said he'd seen you at various dances. I said I was always at home on Sundays. His name is Fane and he's got some sort of job in the East. Yes, he's a doctor. Is he in love with you? Upon my word, I don't know. I should have thought you knew by now when a young man was in love with you. I wouldn't marry him if he were, said Kitty lightly. Mrs. Garston did not answer. Her silence was heavy with displeasure. Kitty flushed. She knew that her mother did not care now whom she married so long as somehow she got her off her hands, underscore x underscore. During the next week she met him at three dances and now, his shyness perhaps wearing off a little, he was somewhat more communicative. He was a doctor, certainly, but he did not practice. He was a bacteriologist, Kitty had only a very vague idea what that meant, and he had a job at Ching Yen. He was going back in the autumn. He talked a good deal about China. She made it a practice to appear interested in whatever people talked to her of, but indeed the life in Qingyan sounded quite jolly. There were clubs in tennis and racing and polo and golf. Do people dance much there? Oh, yes, I think so. She wondered whether he told her these things with a motive. He seemed to like her society, but never by a pressure of the hand, by a glance or by a word. Did he give the smallest indication that he looked upon her as anything but a girl whom you met and danced with? On the following Sunday he came again to their house. Her father happened to come in, it was raining and he had not been able to play golf and he and Walter Fane had a long chat. She asked her father afterwards what they had talked of. It appears he's stationed in Ching Yen. The Chief Justice is an old friend of mine at the bar. He seems an unusually intelligent young man. She knew that her father was as a rule bored to death by the young people whom for her sake and now her sisters he had been forced for years to entertain. It's not often you like any of my young men, father, she said. His kind, tired eyes rested upon her. Are you going to marry him by any chance? Certainly not. Is he in love with you? He shows no sign of it. Do you like him? I don't think I do very much. He irritates me a little. He was not her type at all. He was short, 
but not thick set, slight rather and thin. Dark and clean shaven, with very regular, clear cut features. His eyes were almost black, but not large, they were not very mobile and they rested on objects with a singular persistence. They were curious, but not very pleasant eyes. With his straight, delicate nose, his fine brow and well-shaped mouth, he ought to have been good-looking. But surprisingly enough, he was not. When Kitty began to think of him at all, she was surprised that he should have such good features when you took them one by one and yet be so far from handsome. His face was cold. His expression was slightly sarcastic, and now that Kitty knew him better she realized that she was not quite at ease with him. He had no gaiety. By the time the season drew to its end they had seen a good deal of one another, but he had remained as aloof and impenetrable as ever. He was not exactly shy with her, but embarrassed. His conversation remained strangely impersonal. Kitty came to the conclusion that he was not in the least in love with her. He liked her and found her easy to talk to. But when he returned to Qingyin in November, he would not think of her again. She thought it not impossible that he was engaged all the time to some nurse in a hospital at Qingyin. The daughter of a clergyman, dull, plain, flat-footed and strenuous, that was the wife that would exactly suit him. Then came the announcement of Doris's engagement to Geoffrey Dennison. Doris, at 18, was making quite a good marriage, and she was 25 and single. Supposing she did not marry at all? That season the only person who had proposed to her was a boy of twenty who was still at Oxford. She couldn't marry a boy five years younger than herself. She had made a hash of things. Last year she had refused a widowed knight of the bath with three children. She almost wished she hadn't. Mother would be horrible now, and Doris. Doris, who had always been sacrificed because she, Kitty, was expected to make the brilliant match, would not fail to crow over her. Kitty's heart sank, underscore eleven underscore. But one afternoon, when she was walking home from Harrods, she chanced to meet Walter Fane in the Brompton Road. He stopped and talked to her. Then, casually, he asked her if she would not take a turn with him in the park. She had no particular wish to go home. It was not just then a very agreeable place. They strolled along, talking as they always talked, of casual things, and he asked her where she was going for the summer. Oh, we always bury ourselves in the country. You see? Father is exhausted after the term's work and we just go to the quietest place we can find. Kitty spoke with her tongue in her cheek. For she knew quite well that her father had not nearly enough work to tire him and even if he had his convenience would never have been consulted in the choice of a holiday. But a quiet place was a cheap place. Don't you think those chairs look rather inviting, said Walter suddenly. She followed his eyes and saw two green chairs by themselves under a tree on the grass. Let us sit in them, she said. But when they were seated he seemed to grow strangely abstracted. He was an odd creature. She chattered on, however, gaily enough and wondered why he had asked her to walk with him in the park. Perhaps he was going to confide in her his passion for the flat-footed nurse in Qingyin. Suddenly he turned to her, interrupting her in the middle of a sentence. 
so that she could not but see that he had not been listening, and his face was chalk white. I want to say something to you. She looked at him quickly, and she saw that his eyes were filled with a painful anxiety. His voice was strained, low, and not quite steady. But before she could ask herself what this agitation meant he spoke again. I want to ask you if you'll marry me. You could knock me down with a feather. She answered so surprised that she looked at him blankly. Didn't you know I was awfully in love with you? You never showed it. I'm very awkward and clumsy. I always find it more difficult to say the things I mean than the things I don't. Her heart began to beat a little more quickly. She had been proposed to often before. But gaily or sentimentally, and she had answered in the same fashion. No one had ever asked her to marry him in a manner which was so abrupt and yet strangely tragic. It's very kind of you. She said, doubtfully. I fell in love with you the first time I saw you. I wanted to ask you before, but I could never bring myself to it. I'm not sure if that's very well put, she chuckled. She was glad to have an opportunity to laugh a little, for on that fine, sunny day the air about them seemed on a sudden heavy with foreboding. He frowned darkly. Oh, you know what I mean. I didn't want to lose hope. But now you're going away and in the autumn I have to go back to China. I've never thought of you in that way, she said helplessly. He said nothing more. He looked down on the grass sullenly. He was a very odd creature. But now that he had told her she felt in some mysterious way that his love was something she had never met before. She was a little frightened, but she was elated also. His impassivity was vaguely impressive. You must give me time to think. Still he did not say anything. He did not stir. Did he mean to keep her there till she had decided? That was absurd. She must talk it over with her mother. She ought to have got up when she spoke, she had waited thinking he would answer. And now, she did not know why, she found it difficult to make a movement. She did not look at him, but she was conscious of his appearance. She had never seen herself marrying a man so little taller than herself. When you sat close to him you saw how good his features were, and how cold his face. It was strange when you couldn't help being conscious of the devastating passion which was in his heart. I don't know you, I don't know you at all, she said tremulously. He gave her a look and she felt her eyes drawn to his. They had a tenderness which she had never seen in them before, but there was something beseeching in them. Like a dog's that has been whipped, which slightly exasperated her. I think I improve on acquaintance, he said. Of course you're shy, aren't you? It was certainly the oddest proposal she had ever had. And even now it seemed to her that they were saying to one another the last things you would have expected on such an occasion. She was not in the least in love with him. She did not know why she hesitated to refuse him at once. I'm awfully stupid, he said. I want to tell you that I love you more than anything in the world. But I find it so awfully difficult to say. Now that was odd too, for inexplicably enough it touched her, he wasn't really cold, of course, it was his manner that was unfortunate. She liked him at that moment better than she had ever liked him before. 
Doris was to be married in November. He would be on his way to China then, and if she married him she would be with him. It wouldn't be very nice to be a bridesmaid at Doris's wedding. She would be glad to escape that. And then Doris as a married woman and herself still single. Everyone knew how young Doris was and it would make her seem older. It would put her on the shelf. It wouldn't be a very good marriage for her, but it was a marriage. And the fact that she would live in China made it easier. She was afraid of her mother's bitter tongue. Why? All the girls who had come out with her were married long ago, and most of them had children. She was tired of going to see them and gushing over their babies. Walter Fane offered her a new life. She turned to him with a smile which she well knew the effect of. If I were so rash as to say I'd marry you, when would you want to marry me? He gave a sudden gasp of delight, and his white cheeks flushed. Now. At once. As soon as possible. We'd go to Italy for our honeymoon. August and September. That would save her from spending the summer in a country vicarage, hired at five guineas a week, with her father and mother. In a flash she saw in her mind's eye the announcement in the underscore. Morning Post underscore that, the bridegroom having to return to the east, the wedding would take place at once. She knew her mother well enough, she could be counted on to make a splash. For the moment at least Doris would be in the background, and when Doris's much grander wedding took place she would be far away. She stretched out her hand. I think I like you very much. You must give me time to get used to you. Then it's yes, he interrupted. I suppose so. Underscore 12 underscore she knew him very little then, and now, though they had been married for nearly two years, she knew him but little more. At first she had been touched by his kindness and flattered, though surprised, by his passion. He was extremely considerate. He was very attentive to her comfort. She never expressed the slightest wish without his hastening to gratify it. He was constantly giving her little presents. When she happened to feel ill no one could have been kinder or more thoughtful. She seemed to do him a favor when she gave him the opportunity of doing something tiresome for her. And he was always exceedingly polite. He rose to his feet when she entered a room, he gave her his hand to help her out of a car, if he chanced to meet her in the street he took off his hat. He was solicitous to open the door for her when she left a room, he never came into her bedroom or her boudoir without a knock. He treated her not as Kitty had seen most men treat their wives, but as though she were a fellow guest in a country house. It was pleasing and yet a trifle comic. She would have felt more at home with him if he had been more casual. Nor did their conjugal relations draw her closer to him. He was passionate then, fierce, oddly hysterical too, and sentimental. It disconcerted her to realize how emotional he really was. His self-control was due to shyness or to long training, she did not know which. It seemed to her faintly contemptible that when she lay in his arms, his desire appeased, he who was so timid of saying absurd things, who so feared to be ridiculous, should use baby talk. She had offended him bitterly once by laughing and telling him that he was talking the most fearful slush. She had felt his arms grow limp about her. 
He remained quite silent for a little while, and then without a word released her and went into his own room. She didn't want to hurt his feelings, and a day or two later she said to him, You silly old thing, I don't mind what nonsense you talk to me. He had laughed in a shamefaced way. She had discovered very soon that he had an unhappy disability to lose himself. He was self-conscious. When there was a party and everyone started singing Walter, could never bring himself to join in. He sat there smiling to show that he was pleased and amused. But his smile was forced, it was more like a sarcastic smirk, and you could not help feeling that he thought all those people enjoying themselves a pack of fools. He could not bring himself to play the round games which Kitty with her high spirits found such a lark. On their journey out to China he had absolutely refused to put on fancy dress when everyone else was wearing it. It disturbed her pleasure that he should so obviously think the whole thing a bore. Kitty was lively, she was willing to chatter all day long and she laughed easily. His silence disconcerted her. He had a way which exasperated her of returning no answer to some casual remark of hers. It was true that it needed no answer. But an answer all the same would have been pleasant. If it was raining and she said, it's raining cats and dogs, she would have liked him to say, yes, isn't it? He remained silent. Sometimes she would have liked to shake him. I said it was raining cats and dogs, she repeated. I heard you, he answered, with his affectionate smile. It showed that he had not meant to be offensive. He did not speak because he had nothing to say. But if nobody spoke unless he had something to say, Kitty reflected with a smile. The human race would very soon lose the use of speech, underscore 13 underscore the fact was, of course, that he had no charm. That was why he was not popular. And she had not been long in Qingyan before she discovered that he was not. She remained very vague about his work. It was enough for her to realize, and she did this quite distinctly. That to be the government bacteriologist was no great fry. He seemed to have no desire to discuss that part of his life with her because she was willing to be interested in anything at first she had asked him about it. He put her off with a jest. It's very dull and technical, he said on another occasion. And it's grossly underpaid. He was very reserved. All she knew about his antecedents, his birth, his education, and his life before he met her, she had elicited by direct questioning. It was odd, the only thing that seemed to annoy him was a question, and when, in her natural curiosity, she fired a string of them at him, his answers became at every one more abrupt. She had the wit to see that he did not care to reply because he had anything to hide from her, but merely from a natural secretiveness. It bored him to talk about himself. It made him shy and uncomfortable. He did not know how to be open. He was fond of reading, but he read books which seemed to Kitty very dull. If he was not busy with some scientific treatise, he would read books about China or historical works. He never relaxed. She did not think he could. He was fond of games. He played tennis and bridge. She wondered why he had ever fallen in love with her. She could not imagine anyone less suited than herself to this restrained,
cold and self-possessed man. And yet it was quite certain that he loved her madly. He would do anything in the world to please her. He was like wax in her hands. When she thought of one side he showed her, a side which only she had seen, she a little despised him. She wondered whether his sarcastic manner, with its contemptuous tolerance for so many persons and things she admired, was merely a facade to conceal a profound weakness. She supposed he was clever, everyone seemed to think he was. But except very occasionally when he was with two or three people he liked and was in the mood, she had never found him entertaining. He did not precisely bore her. He left her indifferent, underscore 14, underscore, though Kitty had met his wife at various tea parties she had been some weeks in Chingin before she saw Charles Townsend. She was introduced to him only when with her husband she went to dine at his house. Kitty was on the defensive. Charles Townsend was assistant colonial secretary, and she had no mind to allow him to use her with the condescension which, notwithstanding her good manners, she discerned in Mrs. Townsend. The room in which they were received was spacious. It was furnished as was every other drawing room she had been in at Chingin in a comfortable and homely style. It was a large party. They were the last to come and as they entered Chinese servants in uniform were handing round cocktails and olives. Mrs. Townsend greeted them in her casual fashion and looking at a list told Walter whom he was to take in to dinner. Kitty saw a tall and very handsome man bear down on them. This is my husband. I am to have the privilege of sitting next to you, he said. She immediately felt at ease and the sense of hostility vanished from her bosom. Though his eyes were smiling she had seen in them a quick look of surprise. She understood it perfectly and it made her inclined to laugh. I shan't be able to eat any dinner, he said and if I know Dorothy the dinner's damned good. Why not? I ought to have been told. Someone really ought to have warned me. What about? No one said a word. How was I to know that I was going to meet a raging beauty? Now what am I to say to that? Nothing. Leave me to do the talking and I'll say it over and over again. Kitty, unmoved, wondered what exactly his wife had told him about her. He must have asked. And Townsend, looking down on her with his laughing eyes, suddenly remembered. What is she like? He had inquired when his wife told him she had met Dr. Fane's bride. Oh, quite a nice little thing. Actressy. Was she on the stage? Oh, no, I don't think so. Her father's a doctor or a lawyer or something. I suppose we shall have to ask them to dinner. There's no hurry, is there? When they were sitting side by side at table, he told her that he had known Walter Fane ever since he came to the colony. We play bridge together. He's far and away the best bridge player at the club. She told Walter on the way home. That's not saying very much, you know. How does he play? Not badly. He plays a winning hand very well. But when he has bad cards he goes all to pieces. Does he play as well as you? I have no illusions about my play. 
I should describe myself as a very good player in the second class. Townsend thinks he's in the first. He isn't. Don't you like him? I neither like him nor dislike him. I believe he's not bad at his job and everyone says he's a good sportsman. He doesn't very much interest me. It was not the first time that Walter's moderation had exasperated her. She asked herself why it was necessary to be so prudent. You either liked people or you didn't. She had liked Charles Townsend very much. And she had not expected to. He was probably the most popular man in the colony. It was supposed that the colonial secretary would retire soon and everyone hoped that Townsend would succeed him. He played tennis and polo and golf. He kept racing ponies. He was always ready to do anyone a good turn. He never let red tape interfere with him. He put on no airs. Kitty did not know why she had resented hearing him so well spoken of. She could not help thinking he must be very conceited. She had been extremely silly, that was the last thing you could accuse him of. She had enjoyed her evening. They had talked of the theaters in London, and of Ascot and Cows, all the things she knew about, so that really she might have met him at some nice house in Lennox Gardens, and later. When the men came into the drawing room after dinner, he had strolled over and sat beside her again. Though he had not said anything very amusing, he had made her laugh. It must have been the way he said it. There was a caressing sound in his deep, rich voice, a delightful expression in his kind, shining blue eyes, which made you feel very much at home with him. Of course he had charm. That was what made him so pleasant. He was tall, six foot two at least, she thought, and he had a beautiful figure. He was evidently in very good condition, and he had not a spare ounce of fat on him. He was well dressed, the best dressed man in the room, and he wore his clothes well. She liked a man to be smart. Her eyes wandered to Walter. He really should try to be a little better turned out. She noticed Townsend's cufflinks and waistcoat buttons. She had seen similar ones at Cartier's. Of course the Townsends had private means. His face was deeply sunburned, but the sun had not taken the healthy color from his cheeks. She liked the little trim curly mustache which did not conceal his full red lips. He had black hair, short and brushed very sleek. But of course his eyes, under thick, bushy eyebrows, were his best feature, they were so very blue, and they had a laughing tenderness which persuaded you of the sweetness of his disposition. No man who had those blue eyes could bear to hurt anyone. She could not but know that she had made an impression on him. If he had not said charming things to her his eyes, warm with admiration, would have betrayed him. His ease was delightful. He had no self-consciousness. Kitty was at home in these circumstances, and she admired the way in which amid the banter which was the staple of their conversation he insinuated every now and then a pretty, flattering speech. When she shook hands with him on leaving he gave her hand a pressure that she could not mistake. I hope we shall see you again soon. He said casually, but his eyes gave his words a meaning which she could not fail to see. Ching Yen is very small, isn't it, she said, underscore 15 underscore. 
Who would have thought then that within three months they would be on such terms? He had told her since that he was crazy about her on that first evening. She was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. He remembered the dress she wore. It was her wedding dress, and he said she looked like a lily of the valley. She knew that he was in love with her before he told her, and a little frightened she kept him at a distance. He was impetuous and it was difficult. She was afraid to let him kiss her. For the thought of his arms about her made her heart beat so fast. She had never been in love before. It was wonderful. And now that she knew what love was she felt a sudden sympathy for the love that Walter bore her. She teased him, playfully, and saw that he enjoyed it. She had been perhaps a little afraid of him, but now she had more confidence. She chaffed him and it amused her to see the slow smile with which at first he received her banter. He was surprised and pleased. One of these days, she thought, he would become quite human. Now that she had learnt something of passion it diverted her to play lightly. Like a harpist running his fingers across the strings of his harp on his affections. She laughed when she saw how she bewildered and confused him. And when Charlie became her lover the situation between herself and Walter seemed exquisitely absurd. She could hardly look at him, so grave and self-controlled, without laughing. She was too happy to feel unkindly towards him. Except for him, after all, she would never have known Charlie. She had hesitated some time before the final step. Not because she did not want to yield to Charlie's passion, her own was equal to his, but because her upbringing and all the conventions of her life intimidated her. She was amazed afterwards, and the final act was due to accident, neither of them had seen the opportunity till it was face to face with them. To discover that she felt in no way different from what she had before. She had expected that it would cause some, she hardly knew what. Fantastic change in her so that she would feel like somebody else. And when she had a chance to look at herself in the glass she was bewildered to see the same woman she had seen the day before. Are you angry with me? he asked her. I adore you, she whispered. Don't you think you were very silly to waste so much time? A perfect fool. Underscore 16 underscore her happiness, sometimes almost more than she could bear, renewed her beauty. Just before she marry, beginning to lose her first freshness, she had looked tired and drawn. The uncharitable said that she was going off. But there is all the difference between a girl of 25 and a married woman of that age. She was like a rosebud that is beginning to turn yellow at the edges of the petals. And then suddenly she was a rose in full bloom. Her starry eyes gained a more significant expression, her skin. That feature which had always been her greatest pride and most anxious care was dazzling, it could not be compared to the peach or to the flower. It was they that demanded comparison with it. She looked eighteen once more. She was at the height of her glowing loveliness. It was impossible not to remark it and her women friends asked her in little friendly asides if she was going to have a baby. The indifferent who had said she was just a very pretty woman with a long nose admitted that they had misjudged her. She was what Charlie had called her the first time he saw her. A raging beauty. They managed their intrigue with skill. 
He had a broad back, he told her. I will not have you swank about your figure, she interrupted lightly. And it did not matter about him, but for her sake, they mustn't take the smallest risk. They could not meet often alone, not half often enough for him, but he had to think of her first. Sometimes in the curio shop, now and then after luncheon in her house when no one was about, but she saw him a good deal here and there. It amused her then to see the formal way he spoke to her. Jovial, for he was always that, with the same manner he used with every one. Who could imagine when they heard him chaff her with that charming humor of his that so lately he had held her in his passionate arms? She worshipped him. He was splendid. In his smart top boots and his white breeches, when he played polo. In tennis clothes he looked a mere boy. Of course he was proud of his figure, it was the best figure she had ever seen. He took pains to keep it. He never ate bread or potatoes or butter and he took a great deal of exercise. She liked the care he took of his hands. He was manicured once a week. He was a wonderful athlete and the year before he had won the local tennis championship. Certainly he was the best dancer she had ever danced with. It was a dream to dance with him. No one would think he was 40. She told him she did not believe it. I believe it's all bluff and you're really 25. He laughed. He was well pleased. Oh, my dear, I have a boy of 15. I'm a middle-aged gent. In another two or three years I shall just be a fat old party. You'll be adorable when you're a hundred. She liked his black, bushy eyebrows. She wondered whether it was they that gave his blue eyes their disturbing expression. He was full of accomplishments. He could play the piano quite well, ragtime, of course. And he could sing a comic song with a rich voice and good humor. She did not believe there was anything he could not do. He was very clever at his work too, and she shared his pleasure when he told her that the governor had particularly congratulated him on the way he had done some difficult job. Although it's I as says it, he laughed, his eyes charming with the love he bore her, there's not a fellow in the service who could have done it better. Oh! How she wished that she were his wife rather than Walter's! Underscore 17 underscore of course it was not certain yet that Walter knew the truth, and if he didn't it was better perhaps to leave well alone. But if he did, well, in the end it would be the best thing for all of them. At first she had been, if not satisfied, at least resigned to seeing Charlie only by stealth. But time had increased her passion and for some while now she had been increasingly impatient of the obstacles which prevented them from being always together. He had told her so often that he cursed his position which forced him to be so discreet, the ties which bound him, and the ties which bound her, how marvelous it would have been, he said. If they were both free. She saw his point of view, no one wanted a scandal, and of course it required a good deal of thinking over before you changed the course of your life. But if freedom were thrust upon them, ah, then, how simple everything would be. It was not as though anyone would suffer very much. She knew exactly what his relations were with his wife. She was a cold woman and there had been no love between them for years. It was habit that held them together, convenience, and of course the children. It was easier for Charlie than for her. 
Walter loved her, but after all, he was absorbed in his work, and a man always had his club, he might be upset at first, but he would get over it. There was no reason why he should not marry somebody else. Charlie had told her that he could not make out how she came to throw herself away on Walter Fane. She wondered, half smiling, why a little while before she had been terrified at the thought that Walter had caught them. Of course it was startling to see the handle of the door slowly turn. But after all they knew the worst that Walter could do, and they were ready for it. Charlie would feel as great a relief as she that what they both desired more than anything in the world should be thus forced upon them. Walter was a gentleman. She would do him the justice to acknowledge that, and he loved her, he would do the right thing and allow her to divorce him. They had made a mistake and the lucky thing was that they had found it out before it was too late. She made up her mind exactly what she was going to say to him and how she would treat him. She would be kind, smiling, and firm. There was no need for them to quarrel. Later on she would always be glad to see him. She hoped honestly that the two years they had spent together would remain with him as a priceless memory. I don't suppose Dorothy Townsend will mind divorcing Charlie a bit. She thought. Now the youngest boy is going back to England, it will be much nicer for her to be in England too. There's absolutely nothing for her to do in Qingyan. She'll be able to spend all the holidays with her boys. And then she's got her father and mother in England. It was all very simple and everything could be managed without scandal or ill-feeling. And then she and Charlie could marry. Kitty drew a long sigh. They would be very happy. It was worth going through a certain amount of bother to achieve that. Confusedly, one picture jostling another, she thought of the life they would lead together of the fun they would have and the little journeys they would take together, the house they would live in, the positions he would rise to and the help she would be to him. He would be very proud of her and she, she adored him. But through all these daydreams ran a current of apprehension. It was funny. It was as though the wood and the strings of an orchestra played Arcadian melodies and in the bass the drums, softly but with foreboding, beat a grim tattoo. Sooner or later Walter must come home and her heart beat fast at the thought of meeting him. It was strange that he had gone away that afternoon without saying a word to her. Of course she was not frightened of him, after all what could he do, she repeated to herself, but she could not quite allay her uneasiness. Once more she repeated what she would say to him. What was the good of making a scene? She was very sorry, heaven knew she didn't want to cause him pain, but she couldn't help it if she didn't love him. It was no good pretending, and it was always better to tell the truth. She hoped he wouldn't be unhappy, but they had made a mistake and the only sensible thing was to acknowledge it. She would always think kindly of him. But even as she said this to herself a sudden gust of fear made the sweat start out in the palms of her hands. And because she was frightened she grew angry with him. If he wanted to make a scene that was his lookout, he must not be surprised if he got more than he bargained for. She would tell him that she had never cared two pins for him and that not a day had passed since their marriage without her regretting it. He was dull. Oh, how he bored her, bored her, bored her. 
He thought himself so much better than anyone else, it was laughable. He had no sense of humor. She hated his supercilious air, his coldness, and his self-control. It was easy to be self-controlled when you were interested in nothing and nobody but yourself. He was repulsive to her. She hated to let him kiss her. What had he to be so conceited about? He danced rottenly. He was a wet blanket at a party. He couldn't play or sing. He couldn't play polo and his tennis was no better than anybody else's. Bridge? Who cared about Bridge? Kitty worked herself up into a towering passion. Let him dare to reproach her. All that had happened was his own fault. She was thankful that he knew the truth at last. She hated him and wished never to see him again. Yes, she was thankful that it was all over. Why couldn't he leave her alone? He had pestered her into marrying him, and now she was fed up. Fed up. She repeated aloud, trembling with anger. Fed up. Fed up. She heard the car draw up to the gate of their garden. He was coming up the stairs, underscore 18 underscore he came into the room. Her heart was beating wildly and her hands were shaking. It was lucky that she lay on the sofa. She was holding an open book as though she had been reading. He stood for an instant on the threshold and their eyes met. Her heart sank. She felt on a sudden a cold chill pass through her limbs and she shivered. She had that feeling which you describe by saying that someone was walking over your grave. His face was deathly pale. She had seen it like that once before. When they sat together in the park and he asked her to marry him. His dark eyes, immobile and inscrutable, seemed preternaturally large. He knew everything. You're back early. She remarked. Her lips trembled so that she could hardly frame the words. She was terrified. She was afraid she would faint. I think it's about the usual time. His voice sounded strange to her. It was raised on the last word in order to give his remark a casual air, but it was forced. She wondered if he saw that she was shaking in every limb. It was only by an effort that she did not scream. He dropped his eyes. I'm just going to dress. He left the room. She was shattered. For two or three minutes she could not stir, but at last, raising herself from the sofa with difficulty, as though she had had an illness and were still weak, she found her feet. She did not know if her legs would support her. She felt her way by means of chairs and tables to the veranda and then with one hand on the wall went to her room. She put on a tea gown and when she went back into her boudoir, they only used the drawing room when there was a party. He was standing at a table looking at the pictures of the underscore sketch underscore. She had to force herself to enter. Shall we go down? Dinner is ready. Have I kept you waiting? It was dreadful that she could not control the trembling of her lips. When was he going to speak? They sat down and for a moment there was silence between them. Then he made a remark and because it was so commonplace it had a sinister air. The underscore empress underscore didn't come in today, he said. I wonder if she's been delayed by a storm. Was she due today? Yes. Then he made a remark 
and because it was so commonplace it had a sinister air. The underscore empress underscore didn't come in today, he said. I wonder if she's been delayed by a storm. Was she due today? Yes. She looked at him now and saw that his eyes were fixed on his plate. He made another observation, equally trivial, about a tennis tournament that was about to be played. And he spoke at length. His voice as a rule was agreeable, with a variety of tone, but now he spoke on one note. It was strangely unnatural. It gave Kitty the impression that he was speaking from a long way off. And all the time his eyes were directed to his plate, or the table, or to a picture on the wall. He would not meet hers. She realized that he could not bear to look at her. Shall we go upstairs, he said when dinner was finished? If you like. She rose and he held open the door for her. His eyes were cast down as she passed him. When they reached the sitting room he took up the illustrated paper once more. Is this a new underscore sketch underscore? I don't think I've seen it. I don't know. I haven't noticed. It had been lying about for a fortnight, and she knew that he had looked it through and through. He took it and sat down. She lay again on the sofa and took her book. As a rule in the evening, when they were alone, they played Kun Can or Patience. He was leaning back in an armchair, in a comfortable attitude and his attention seemed absorbed by the illustration he was looking at. He did not turn the page. She tried to read, but she could not see the print before her eyes. The words were blurred. Her head began to ache violently. When would he speak? They sat in silence for an hour. She gave up the pretense of reading and letting her novel fall on her lap, gazed into space. She was afraid to make the smallest gesture or the smallest sound. He sat quite still, in that same easy attitude, and stared with those wide, immobile eyes of his at the picture. His stillness was strangely menacing. It gave Kitty the feeling of a wild beast prepared to spring. When suddenly he stood up she started. She clenched her hands and she felt herself grow pale. Now. I have some work to do, he said in that quiet, toneless voice, his eyes averted. If you don't mind I'll go into my study. I dare say you'll have gone to bed by the time I've finished. I underscore am underscore rather tired tonight. Well, good night. Good night. He left the room, underscore 19 underscore. As soon as she could next morning, she rang Townsend up at his office. Yes, what is it? I want to see you. My dear, I'm awfully busy. I'm a working man. It's very important. Can I come down to the office? Oh, no, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Well, come here then. I can't possibly get away. What about this afternoon? And don't you think it would be better if I didn't come to your house? I must see you at once. There was a pause, and she was afraid that she had been cut off. Are you there? she asked anxiously. Yes, I was thinking. Has anything happened? I can't tell you over the telephone. There was another silence before he spoke again. Well, look here, 
I can manage to see you for 10 minutes at 1 if that'll do. You'd better go to Cucho's, and I'll come along as soon as I can. The curio shop, she asked in dismay. Well, we can't meet in the lounge at the Ching Yen Hotel very well, he answered. She noticed a trace of irritation in his voice. Very well. I'll go to Cucho's. Underscore XX underscore she got out of her rickshaw in the Victoria Road and walked up the steep, narrow lane till she came to the shop. She lingered outside a moment as though her attention were attracted by the brick abrac which was displayed. But a boy who was standing there on the watch for customers, recognizing her at once, gave her a broad smile of connivance. He said something in Chinese to someone within and the master, a little, fat-faced man in a black gown, came out and greeted her. She walked in quickly. Mr. Townsend no come yet. You go topside, yes? She went to the back of the shop and walked up the rickety, dark stairs. The Chinese followed her and unlocked the door that led into the bedroom. It was stuffy and there was an acrid smell of opium. She sat down on a sandalwood chest. In a moment she heard a heavy step on the creaking stairs. Townsend came in and shut the door behind him. His face bore a sullen look, but as he saw her it vanished and he smiled in that charming way of his. He took her quickly in his arms and kissed her lips. Now what's the trouble? It makes me feel better just to see you, she smiled. He sat down on the bed and lit a cigarette. You look rather washed out this morning. I don't wonder, she answered. I don't think I closed my eyes all night. He gave her a look. He was smiling still. But his smile was a little set and unnatural. She thought there was a shade of anxiety in his eyes. He knows, she said. There was an instant's pause before he answered. What did he say? He hasn't said anything. What? He looked at her sharply. What makes you think he knows then? Everything. His look. The way he talked at dinner. Was he disagreeable? No, on the contrary. He was scrupulously polite. For the first time since we married he didn't kiss me goodnight. She dropped her eyes. She was not sure if Charlie understood. As a rule Walter took her in his arms and pressed his lips to hers and would not let them go. His whole body grew tender and passionate with his kiss. Why do you imagine he didn't say anything? I don't know. There was a pause. Kitty sat very still on the sandalwood box and looked with anxious attention at Townsend. His face once more was sullen and there was a frown between his brows. His mouth drooped a little at the corners. But all at once he looked up and a gleam of malicious amusement came into his eyes. I wonder if he underscore is underscore going to say anything. She did not answer. She did not know what he meant. After all, he wouldn't be the first man who shut his eyes in a case of this sort. What has he to gain by making a row? If he'd wanted to make a row, he would have insisted on coming into your room. His eyes twinkled and his lips broke into a broad smile. We should have looked a pair of damned fools. 
I wish you could have seen his face last night. I expect he was upset. It was naturally a shock. It's a damned humiliating position for any man. He always looks a fool. Walter doesn't give me the impression of a fellow who'd care to wash a lot of dirty linen in public. I don't think he would, she answered reflectively. He's very sensitive. I've discovered that. That's all to the good as far as we're concerned. You know, it's a very good plan to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and ask yourself how you would act in his place. There's only one way in which a man can save his face when he's in that sort of position and that is to pretend he knows nothing. I bet you anything you like that that is exactly what he's going to do. The more Townsend talked the more buoyant he became. His blue eyes sparkled and he was once more his gay and jovial self. He irradiated an encouraging confidence. Heaven knows, I don't want to say anything disagreeable about him. But when you come down to brass tacks a bacteriologist is no great shakes. The chances are that I shall be colonial secretary when Simmons goes home. And it's to Walter's interest to keep on the right side of me. He's got his bread and butter to think of, like the rest of us. Do you think the colonial office are going to do much for a fellow who makes a scandal? Believe me. He's got everything to gain by holding his tongue and everything to lose by kicking up a row. Kitty moved uneasily. She knew how shy Walter was and she could believe that the fear of a scene and the dread of public attention might have influence upon him. But she could not believe that he would be affected by the thought of a material advantage. Perhaps she didn't know him very well, but Charlie didn't know him at all. Has it occurred to you that he's madly in love with me? He did not answer, but he smiled at her with roguish eyes. She knew and loved that charming look of his. Well, what is it? I know you're going to say something awful. Well, you know, women are often under the impression that men are much more madly in love with them than they really are. For the first time she laughed. His confidence was catching. What a monstrous thing to say. I put it to you that you haven't been bothering much about your husband lately. Perhaps he isn't quite so much in love with you as he was. At all events, I shall never delude myself that underscore you underscore are madly in love with me, she retorted. That's where you're wrong. Ah. Uh, how good it was to hear him say that. She knew it and her belief in his passion warmed her heart. As he spoke he rose from the bed and came and sat down beside her on the sandalwood box. He put his arm round her waist. Don't worry your silly little head a moment longer, he said. I promise you there's nothing to fear. I'm as certain as I am of anything that he's going to pretend he knows nothing. You know, this sort of thing is awfully difficult to prove. You say he's in love with you. Perhaps he doesn't want to lose you altogether. I swear I'd accept anything rather than that if you were my wife. She leaned towards him. Her body became limp and yielding against his arm. The love she felt for him was almost torture. His last words had struck her. Perhaps Walter loved her so passionately that he was prepared to accept any humiliation if sometimes she would let him love her. She could understand that. 
for that was how she felt towards Charlie. A thrill of pride passed through her, and at the same time a faint sensation of contempt for a man who could love so slavishly. She put her arm lovingly round Charlie's neck. You're simply wonderful. I was shaking like a leaf when I came here and you've made everything all right. He took her face in his hand and kissed her lips. Darling. You're such a comfort to me, she sighed. I'm sure you need not be nervous. And you know I'll stand by you. I won't let you down. She put away her fears, but for an instant unreasonably she regretted that her plans for the future were shattered. Now that all danger was past she almost wished that Walter were going to insist on a divorce. I knew I could count on you, she said. So I should hope. Oughtn't you to go and have your tiffin? Oh. Damn my tiffin. He drew her more closely to him, and now she was held tight in his arms. His mouth sought hers. Oh, Charlie, you must let me go. Never. She gave a little laugh. A laugh of happy love and of triumph. His eyes were heavy with desire. He lifted her to her feet and not letting her go, but holding her close to his breast he locked the door, underscore 21 underscore. All through the afternoon she thought of what Charlie had said about Walter. They were dining out that evening, and when he came back from the club she was dressing. He knocked at her door. Come in. He did not open. I'm going straight along to dress. How long will you be? Ten minutes. He said nothing more, but went to his own room. His voice had that constrained note which she had heard in it the night before. She felt fairly sure of herself now. She was ready before he was, and when he came downstairs she was already seated in the car. I'm afraid I've kept you waiting, he said. I shall survive it, she replied. And she was able to smile as she spoke. She made an observation or two as they drove down the hill, but he answered curtly. She shrugged her shoulders, she was growing a trifle impatient. If he wanted to sulk, let him, she didn't care. They drove in silence till they reached their destination. It was a large dinner party. There were too many people and too many courses. While Kitty chatted gaily with her neighbors she watched Walter. He was deathly pale, and his face was pinched. Your husband is looking rather washed out. I thought he didn't mind the heat. Has he been working very hard? He always works hard. I suppose you're going away soon? Oh, yes, I think I shall go to Japan as I did last year, she said. The doctor says I must get out of the heat if I don't want to go all to pieces. Walter did not as usual when they were dining out give her a little smiling glance now and then. He never looked at her. She had noticed that when he came down to the car he kept his eyes averted, and he did the same when, with his usual politeness, he gave her his hand to alight. Now, talking with the women on either side of him, he did not smile, but looked at them with steady and unblinking eyes, and really his eyes looked enormous and in that pale face coal black. His face was set and stern. He must be an agreeable companion thought Kitty ironically. The idea of those unfortunate ladies trying to indulge in small talk with that grim mask not a little diverted her. 
Of course he knew, there was no doubt about that. And he was furious with her. Why hadn't he said anything? Was it really because, though angry and hurt, he loved her as much that he was afraid she would leave him? The thought made her ever so slightly despise him, but good-naturedly, after all, he was her husband and he provided her with board and lodging. So long as he didn't interfere with her and let her do as she liked she would be quite nice to him. On the other hand, perhaps his silence was due merely to a morbid timidity. Charlie was right when he said that no one would hate a scandal more than Walter. He never made a speech if he could help it. He had told her once that when he was subpoenaed as a witness on a case where he was to give expert evidence he had hardly slept for a week before. His shyness was a disease. And there was another thing, men were very vain, and so long as no one knew what had happened it might be that Walter would be content to ignore it. Then she wondered whether by any possibility Charlie was right when he suggested that Walter knew which side his bread was buttered. Charlie was the most popular man in the colony and soon would be colonial secretary. He could be very useful to Walter. On the other hand, he could make himself very unpleasant if Walter put his back up. Her heart exulted as she thought of her lover's strength and determination. She felt so defenseless in his virile arms. Men were strange. It would never have occurred to her that Walter was capable of such baseness, and yet you never knew. Perhaps his seriousness was merely a mask for a mean and pettifogging nature. The more she considered it, the more likely it seemed that Charlie was right. And she turned her glance once more on her husband. There was no indulgence in it. It happened that just then the women on either side of him were talking with their neighbors and he was left alone. He was staring straight in front of him, forgetful of the party. And his eyes were filled with a mortal sadness. It gave Kitty a shock, underscore 22 underscore next day, when she was lying down after lunch and dozing, she was aroused by a knock at her door. Who is it? She cried irritably. At that hour she was unaccustomed to be disturbed. I. She recognized her husband's voice and she sat up quickly. Come in. Did I wake you? he asked as he entered. In point of fact you did, she answered in the natural tone she had adopted with him for the last two days. Will you come into the next room? I want to have a little talk with you. Her heart gave a sudden beat against her ribs. I'll put on a dressing gown. He left her. She slipped her bare feet into mules and wrapped herself in a kimono. She looked in the glass. She was very pale and she put on some rouge. She stood at the door for a moment nerving herself for the interview, and then with a bold face joined him. How did you manage to get away from the laboratory at this hour? she said. I don't often see you at this sort of time. Won't you sit down? He did not look at her. He spoke gravely. She was glad to do as he asked, her knees were a little shaky and unable to continue in that jocular tone she kept silent. He sat also and lit a cigarette. His eyes wandered restlessly about the room. He seemed to have some difficulty in starting. Suddenly he looked full at her, and because he had held his eyes so long averted, 
His direct gaze gave her such a fright that she smothered a cry. Have you ever heard of Meitanfu? he asked. There's been a good deal about it in the papers lately. She stared at him in astonishment. She hesitated. Is that the place where there's cholera? Mr. Arbuthnot was talking about it last night. There's an epidemic. I believe it's the worst they've had for years. There was a medical missionary there. He died of cholera three days ago. There's a French convent there, and of course there's the customs man. Everyone else has got out. His eyes were still fixed on her, and she could not lower hers. She tried to read his expression, but she was nervous. And she could only discern a strange watchfulness. How could he look so steadily? He did not even blink. The French nuns are doing what they can. They've turned the orphanage into a hospital. But the people are dying like flies. I've offered to go and take charge. You. She started violently. Her first thought was that if he went she would be free and without let or hindrance could see Charlie. But the thought shocked her. She felt herself go scarlet. Why did he watch her like that? She looked away in embarrassment. Is that necessary? She faltered. There's not a foreign doctor in the place. But you're not a doctor, you're a bacteriologist. I am an MD, you know, and before I specialized I did a good deal of general work in a hospital. The fact that I'm first and foremost a bacteriologist is all to the good. It will be an admirable chance for research work. He spoke almost flippantly, and when she glanced at him she was surprised to see in his eyes a gleam of mockery. She could not understand. But won't it be awfully dangerous? Awfully. He smiled. It was a derisive grimace. She leaned her forehead on her hand. Suicide. It was nothing short of that. Dreadful. She had not thought he would take it like that. She couldn't let him do that. It was cruel. It was not her fault if she did not love him. She couldn't bear the thought that he should kill himself for her sake. Tears flowed softly down her cheeks. What are you crying for? His voice was cold. You're not obliged to go, are you? No. I go of my own free will. Please don't, Walter. It would be too awful if something happened. Supposing you died? Though his face remained impassive the shadow of a smile once more crossed his eyes. He did not answer. Where is this place? she asked after a pause. Mei Tenfu? It's on a tributary of the Western River. We should go up the Western River and then by chair. Who is we? You and I. She looked at him quickly. She thought she had heard amiss. But now the smile in his eyes had traveled to his lips. His dark eyes were fixed on her. Are you expecting me to come too? I thought you'd like to. Her breath began to come very fast. A shudder passed through her. But surely it's no place for a woman. The missionary sent his wife and children down weeks ago, and the A, P, C, the man and his wife came down. I met her at a tea party. 
I've just remembered that she said they left some place on account of cholera. There are five French nuns there. Panic seized her. I don't know what you mean. It would be madness for me to go. You know how delicate I am. Dr. Hayward said I must get out of Chingyan on account of the heat. I could never stand the heat up there. And cholera. I should be frightened out of my wits. It's just asking for trouble. There's no reason for me to go. I should die. He did not answer. She looked at him in her desperation, and she could hardly restrain a cry. His face had a sort of black pallor which suddenly terrified her. She saw in it a look of hatred. Was it possible that he wanted her to die? She answered her own outrageous thought. It's absurd. If you think you ought to go it's your own lookout. But really you can't expect me to. I hate illness. A cholera epidemic. I don't pretend to be very brave and I don't mind telling you that I haven't pluck for that. I shall stay here until it's time for me to go to Japan. I should have thought that you would want to accompany me when I am about to set out on a dangerous expedition. He was openly mocking her now. She was confused. She did not quite know whether he meant what he said or was merely trying to frighten her. I don't think anyone could reasonably blame me for refusing to go to a dangerous place where I had no business or where I could be of no use. You could be of the greatest use. You could cheer and comfort me. She grew even a little paler. I don't understand what you're talking about. I shouldn't have thought it needed more than average intelligence. I'm not going. Walter. It's monstrous to ask me. Then I shall not go either. I shall immediately file my petition. Underscore 23 underscore she looked at him blankly. What he said was so unexpected that at the first moment she could hardly gather its sense. What on earth are you talking about? she faltered. Even to herself her reply rang false. And she saw the look of disdain which it called forth on Walter's stern face. I'm afraid you've thought me a bigger fool than I am. She did not quite know what to say. She was undecided whether indignantly to assert her innocence or to break out into angry reproaches. He seemed to read her thoughts. I've got all the proof necessary. She began to cry. The tears flowed from her eyes without any particular anguish and she did not dry them. To weep gave her a little time to collect herself. But her mind was blank. He watched her without concern, and his calmness frightened her. He grew impatient. You're not going to do much good by crying, you know. His voice, so cold and hard, had the effect of exciting in her a certain indignation. She was recovering her nerve. I don't care. I suppose you have no objection to my divorcing you. It means nothing to a man. Will you allow me to ask why I should put myself to the smallest inconvenience on your account? It can't make any difference to you. It's not much to ask you to behave like a gentleman. I have much too great a regard for your welfare. She sat up now and dried her eyes. What underscore do underscore you mean? She asked him. 
Townsend will marry you only if he is correspondent and the case is so shameless that his wife is forced to divorce him. You don't know what you're talking about, she cried. You stupid fool. His tone was so contemptuous that she flushed with anger. And perhaps her anger was greater because she had never before heard him say to her any but sweet, flattering and delightful things. She had been accustomed to find him subservient to all her whims. If you want the truth you can have it. He's only too anxious to marry me. Dorothy Townsend is perfectly willing to divorce him and we shall be married the moment we're free. Did he tell you that in so many words, or is that the impression you have gained from his manner? Walter's eyes shone with bitter mockery. They made Kitty a trifle uneasy. She was not quite sure that Charlie had ever said exactly that in so many words. He said it over and over again. That's a lie, and you know it's a lie. He loves me with all his heart and soul. He loves me as passionately as I love him. You've found out. I'm not going to deny anything. Why should I? We've been lovers for a year, and I'm proud of it. He means everything in the world to me, and I'm glad that you know at last. We're sick to death of secrecy and compromise and all the rest of it. It was a mistake that I ever married you. I never should have done it, I was a fool. I never cared for you. We never had anything in common. I don't like the people you like, and I'm bored by the things that interest you. I'm thankful it's finished. He watched her without a gesture and without a movement of his face. He listened attentively, and no change in his expression showed that what she said affected him. Do you know why I married you? Because you wanted to be married before your sister Doris. It was true, but it gave her a funny little turn to realize that he knew it. Oddly enough, even in that moment of fear and anger, it excited her compassion. He faintly smiled. I had no illusions about you, he said. I knew you were silly and frivolous and empty-headed. But I loved you. I knew that your aims and ideals were vulgar and commonplace. But I loved you. I knew that you were second-rate. But I loved you. It's comic when I think how hard I tried to be amused by the things that amused you and how anxious I was to hide from you that I wasn't ignorant and vulgar and scandal-mongering and stupid. I knew how frightened you were of intelligence, and I did everything I could to make you think me as big a fool as the rest of the men you knew. I knew that you'd only married me for convenience. I loved you so much, I didn't care. Most people, as far as I can see, when they're in love with someone and the love isn't returned feel that they have a grievance. They grow angry and bitter. I wasn't like that. I never expected you to love me. I didn't see any reason that you should. I never thought myself very lovable. I was thankful to be allowed to love you and I was enraptured when now and then I thought you were pleased with me or when I noticed in your eyes a gleam of good-humored affection. I tried not to bore you with my love. I knew I couldn't afford to do that and I was always on the lookout for the first sign that you were impatient with my affection. What most husbands expect is a right I was prepared to receive as a favor. Kitty, accustomed to flattery all her life, had never heard such things said to her before. Blind Wrath
driving out fear, arose in her heart, it seemed to choke her, and she felt the blood vessels in her temples swell and throb. Wounded vanity can make a woman more vindictive than a lioness robbed of her cubs. Kitty's jaw, always a little too square, protruded with an apish hideousness and her beautiful eyes were black with malice. But she kept her temper in check. If a man hasn't what's necessary to make a woman love him, it's his fault. Not hers. Evidently. His derisive tone increased her irritation. She felt that she could wound him more by maintaining her calm. I'm not very well educated, and I'm not very clever. I'm just a perfectly ordinary young woman. I like the things that the people like among whom I've lived all my life. I like dancing and tennis and theaters, and I like the men who play games. It's quite true that I've always been bored by you, and by the things you like. They mean nothing to me, and I don't want them to. You dragged me round those interminable galleries in Venice. I should have enjoyed myself much more playing golf at Sandwich. I know. I'm sorry if I haven't been all that you expected me to be. Unfortunately, I always found you physically repulsive. You can hardly blame me for that. I don't. Kitty could more easily have coped with the situation if he had raved and stormed. She could have met violence with violence. His self-control was inhuman, and she hated him now, as she had never hated him before. I don't think you're a man at all. Why didn't you break into the room when you knew I was there with Charlie? You might at least have tried to thrash him. Were you afraid? But the moment she had said this she flushed, for she was ashamed. He did not answer, but in his eyes she read an icy disdain. The shadow of a smile flickered on his lips. It may be that, like a historical character, I am too proud to fight. Kitty, unable to think of anything to answer, shrugged her shoulders. For a moment longer, he held her in his immobile gaze. I think I've said all I had to say. If you refuse to come to Meitanfu, I shall file my petition. Why won't you consent to let me divorce you? He took his eyes off her at last. He leaned back in his chair and lit a cigarette. He smoked it to the end without saying a word. Then, throwing away the butt, he gave a little smile. He looked at her once more. If Mrs. Townsend will give me her assurance that she will divorce her husband and if you will give me his written promise to marry you within a week of the two decrees being made absolute. I will do that. There was something in the way he spoke which disconcerted her. But her self-respect obliged her to accept his offer in the grand manner. That is very generous of you. Walter. To her astonishment he burst suddenly into a shout of laughter. She flushed angrily. What are you laughing at? I see nothing to laugh at. I beg your pardon. I dare say my sense of humor is peculiar. She looked at him, frowning. She would have liked to say something bitter and wounding, but no rejoinder occurred to her. He looked at his watch. You had better look sharp if you want to catch Townsend at his office. If you decide to come with me to Meitanfu it would be necessary to start the day after tomorrow. Do you want me to tell him today? They say there is no time like the present. 
her heart began to beat a little faster. It was not uneasiness that she felt, it was. She didn't quite know what it was. She wished she could have had a little longer, she would have liked to prepare Charlie. But she had the fullest confidence in him. He loved her as much as she loved him, and it was treacherous even to let the thought cross her mind that he would not welcome the necessity that was forced upon them. She turned to Walter gravely. I don't think you know what love is. You can have no conception how desperately in love Charlie and I are with one another. It really is the only thing that matters and every sacrifice that our love calls for will be as easy as falling off a log. He gave a little bow, but said nothing and his eyes followed her as she walked with measured step from the room, underscore 24 underscore she sent in a little note to Charlie on which she had written, underscore please see me. It is urgent, underscore. A Chinese boy asked her to wait and brought the answer that Mr. Townsend would see her in five minutes. She was unaccountably nervous. When at last she was ushered into his room Charlie came forward to shake hands with her, but the moment the boy, having closed the door, left them alone he dropped the affable formality of his manner. I say, my dear, you really mustn't come here in working hours. I've got an awful lot to do and we don't want to give people a chance to gossip. She gave him a long look with those beautiful eyes of hers and tried to smile. But her lips were stiff and she could not. I wouldn't have come unless it was necessary. He smiled and took her arm. Well, since you're here come and sit down. It was a long bare room, narrow. With a high ceiling, its walls were painted in two shades of terracotta. The only furniture consisted of a large desk, a revolving chair for Townsend to sit in and a leather armchair for visitors. It intimidated Kitty to sit in this. He sat at the desk. She had never seen him in spectacles before. She did not know that he used them. When he noticed that her eyes were on them, he took them off. I only use them for reading, he said. Her tears came easily, and now she hardly knew why. She began to cry. She had no deliberate intention of deceiving, but rather an instinctive desire to excite his sympathy. He looked at her blankly. Is anything the matter? Oh, my dear. Don't cry. She took out her handkerchief and tried to check her sobs. He rang the bell and when the boy came to the door went to it. If anyone asks for me say I'm out. Very good, sir. The boy closed the door. Charlie sat on the arm of the chair and put his arm round Kitty's shoulders. Now, Kitty dear, tell me all about it. Walter wants a divorce, she said. She felt the pressure of his arm on her shoulder cease. His body stiffened. There was a moment's silence, then Townsend rose from her chair and sat down once more in his. What exactly do you mean, he said. She looked at him quickly, for his voice was hoarse, and she saw that his face was dully red. I've had a talk with him. I've come straight from the house now. He says he has all the proof he wants. You didn't commit yourself, did you? You didn't acknowledge anything? Her heart sank. No, she answered. Are you quite sure, 
he asked, looking at her sharply. Quite sure, she lied again. He leaned back in his chair and stared vacantly at the map of China which was hanging on the wall in front of him. She watched him anxiously. She was somewhat disconcerted at the manner in which he had received the news. She had expected him to take her in his arms and tell her he was thankful. For now they could be together always, but of course men were funny. She was crying softly, not now to arouse sympathy, but because it seemed the natural thing to do. This is a bloody mess we've got into, he said at length. But it's no good losing our heads. Crying isn't going to do us any good, you know. She noticed the irritation in his voice and dried her eyes. It's not my fault, Charlie. I couldn't help it. Of course you couldn't. It was just damned bad luck. I was just as much to blame as you were. The thing to do now is to see how we're going to get out of it. I don't suppose you want to be divorced any more than I do." She smothered a gasp. She gave him a searching look. He was not thinking of her at all. I wonder what his proofs really are. I don't know how he can actually prove that we were together in that room. On the whole we've been about as careful as anyone could be. I'm sure that old fellow at the curio shop wouldn't have given us away. Even if he'd seen us go and there's no reason why we shouldn't hunt curios together. He was talking to himself rather than to her. It's easy enough to bring charges. But it's damned difficult to prove them, any lawyer will tell you that. Our line is to deny everything and if he threatens to bring an action we'll tell him to go to hell and we'll fight it. I couldn't go into court, Charlie. Why on earth not? I'm afraid you'll have to. God knows, I don't want a row, but we can't take it lying down. Why need we defend it? What a question to ask. After all, it's not only you that are concerned, I'm concerned too. But as a matter of fact, I don't think you need be afraid of that. We shall be able to square your husband somehow. The only thing that worries me is the best way to set about it. It looked as though an idea occurred to him, for he turned towards her with his charming smile and his tone. A moment before abrupt and businesslike, became ingratiating. I'm afraid you've been awfully upset, poor little woman. It's too bad. He stretched out his hand and took hers. It's a scrape we've got into, but we shall get out of it. It's not. He stopped and Kitty had a suspicion that he had been about to say that it was not the first he had got out of. The great thing is to keep our heads. You know I shall never let you down. I'm not frightened. I don't care what he does. He smiled still, but perhaps his smile was a trifle forced. If the worst comes to the worst I shall have to tell the governor. He'll curse me like hell, but he's a good fellow and a man of the world. He'll fix it up somehow. It wouldn't do him any good if there was a scandal. What can he do? asked Kitty. He can bring pressure to bear on Walter. If he can't get at him through his ambition he'll get at him through his sense of duty. Kitty was a little chilled. She did not seem able to make Charlie see how desperately grave the situation was. His airiness made her impatient. 
She was sorry that she had come to see him in his office. The surroundings intimidated her. It would have been much easier to say what she wanted if she could have been in his arms with hers round his neck. You don't know Walter, she said. I know that every man has his price. She loved Charlie with all her heart, but his reply disconcerted her. For such a clever man it was a stupid thing to say. I don't think you realize how angry Walter is. You haven't seen his face and the look of his eyes. He did not reply for a moment, but looked at her with a slight smile. She knew what he was thinking. Walter was the bacteriologist and occupied a subordinate position. He would hardly have the impudence to make himself a nuisance to the upper officials of the colony. It's no good deceiving yourself, Charlie, she said earnestly. If Walter has made up his mind to bring in action nothing that you or anybody else can say will have the slightest influence. His face once more grew heavy and sulky. Is it his idea to make me correspondent? At first it was. At last I managed to get him to consent to let me divorce him. Oh, well, that's not so terrible. His manner relaxed again and she saw the relief in his eyes. That seems to me a very good way out. After all, it's the least a man can do, it's the only decent thing. But he makes a condition. He gave her an inquiring glance and he seemed to reflect. Of course I'm not a very rich man, but I'll do anything in my power. Kitty was silent. Charlie was saying things which she would never have expected him to say. And they made it difficult for her to speak. She had expected to blurt it out in one breath. Held in his loving arms, with her burning face hid on his breast. He agrees to my divorcing him if your wife will give him the assurance that she will divorce you. Anything else? Kitty could hardly find her voice. And it's awfully hard to say, Charlie, it sounds dreadful if you'll promise to marry me within a week of the decrees being made absolute. Underscore 25 underscore. For a moment he was silent. Then he took her hand again and pressed it gently. You know, darling, he said, whatever happens we must keep Dorothy out of this. She looked at him blankly. But I don't understand. How can we? Well, we can't only think of ourselves in this world. You know, other things being equal, there's nothing in the world I'd love more than to marry you. But it's quite out of the question. I know Dorothy, nothing would induce her to divorce me. Kitty was becoming horribly frightened. She began to cry again. He got up and sat down beside her with his arm round her waist. Try not to upset yourself, darling. We underscore must underscore keep our heads. I thought you loved me, of course I love you, he said tenderly. You surely can't have any doubt of that now. If she won't divorce you Walter will make you correspondent. He took an appreciable time to answer. His tone was dry. Of course that would ruin my career, but I'm afraid it wouldn't do you much good. If the worst came to the worst I should make a clean breast of it to Dorothy. She'd be dreadfully hurt and wretched, but she'd forgive me. He had an idea. I'm not sure if the best plan wouldn't be to make a clean breast of it anyhow. 
If she went to your husband, I dare say she could persuade him to hold his tongue. Does that mean you don't want her to divorce you? Well, I have got my boys to think of, haven't I? And naturally, I don't want to make her unhappy. We've always got on very well together. She's been an awfully good wife to me, you know. Why did you tell me that she meant nothing to you? I never did. I said I wasn't in love with her. We haven't slept together for years except now and then, on Christmas Day for instance. Or the day before she was going home or the day she came back. She isn't a woman who cares for that sort of thing. But we've always been excellent friends. I don't mind telling you that I depend on her more than anyone has any idea of. Don't you think it would have been better to leave me alone then? She found it strange that with terror catching her breath she could speak so calmly. You were the loveliest little thing I'd seen for years. I just fell madly in love with you. You can't blame me for that. After all, you said you'd never let me down. But, good God, I'm not going to let you down. We've got in an awful scrape, and I'm going to do everything that's humanly possible to get you out of it. Except the one obvious and natural thing. He stood up and returned to his own chair. My dear, you must be reasonable. We'd much better face the situation frankly. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but really I must tell you the truth. I'm very keen on my career. There's no reason why I shouldn't be a governor one of these days, and it's a damned soft job to be a colonial governor. Unless we can hush this up I don't stand a dog's chance. I may not have to leave the service, but there'll always be a black mark against me. If I do have to leave the service then I must go into business in China, where I know people. In either case my only chance is for Dorothy to stick to me. Was it necessary to tell me that you wanted nothing in the world but me? The corners of his mouth drooped peevishly. Oh, my dear. It's rather hard to take quite literally the things a man says when he's in love with you. Didn't you mean them? At the moment. And what's to happen to me if Walter divorces me? If we really haven't a leg to stand on of course we won't defend. There shouldn't be any publicity and people are pretty broad-minded nowadays. For the first time Kitty thought of her mother. She shivered. She looked again at Townsend. Her pain now was tinged with resentment. I'm sure you'd have no difficulty in bearing any inconvenience that I had to suffer, she said. We're not going to get much further by saying disagreeable things to one another, he answered. She gave a cry of despair. It was dreadful that she should love him so devotedly and yet feel such bitterness towards him. It was not possible that he understood how much he meant to her. Oh, Charlie, don't you know how I love you? But... My dear, I love you. Only we're not living in a desert island and we've got to make the best we can out of the circumstances that are forced upon us. You really must be reasonable. How can I be reasonable? To me our love was everything and you were my whole life. It is not very pleasant to realize that to you it was only an episode. Of course it wasn't an episode. But you know, when you ask me to get my wife, to whom I'm very much attached, to divorce me, and ruin my career by marrying you, 
you're asking a good deal. No more than I'm willing to do for you. The circumstances are rather different. The only difference is that you don't love me. One can be very much in love with a woman without wishing to spend the rest of one's life with her. She gave him a quick look and despair seized her. Heavy tears rolled down her cheeks. Oh! How cruel! How can you be so heartless? She began to sob hysterically. He gave an anxious glance at the door. My dear, do try and control yourself. You don't know how I love you, she gasped. I can't live without you. Have you no pity for me? She could not speak any more. She wept without restraint. I don't want to be unkind and, heaven knows, I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I must tell you the truth. It's the ruin of my whole life. Why couldn't you leave me alone? What harm had I ever done you? Of course, if it does you any good to put all the blame on me, you may. Kitty blazed with sudden anger. I suppose I threw myself at your head. I suppose I gave you no peace till you yielded to my entreaties. I don't say that. But I certainly should never have thought of making love to you if you hadn't made it perfectly clear that you were ready to be made love to. Oh, the shame of it. She knew that what he said was true. His face now was sullen and worried and his hands moved uneasily. Every now and then, he gave her a little glance of exasperation. Won't your husband forgive you, he said after a while. I never asked him. Instinctively, he clenched his hands. She saw him suppress the exclamation of annoyance, which came to his lips. Why don't you go to him and throw yourself on his mercy? If he's as much in love with you as you say, he's bound to forgive you. How little you know him. Underscore 26 underscore she wiped her eyes. She tried to pull herself together. Charlie, if you desert me I shall die. She was driven now to appeal to his compassion. She ought to have told him at once. When he knew the horrible alternative that was placed before her his generosity, his sense of justice, his manliness, would be so vehemently aroused that he would think of nothing but her danger. Oh, how passionately she desired to feel his dear, protecting arms around her. Walter wants me to go to Meitan Fu. Oh, but that's the place where the cholera is. They've got the worst epidemic that they've had for 50 years. It's no place for a woman. You can't possibly go there. If you let me down I shall have to. What do you mean? I don't understand. Walter is taking the place of the missionary doctor who died. He wants me to go with him. When? Now. At once. Townsend pushed back his chair and looked at her with puzzled eyes. I may be very stupid, but I can't make head or tail out of what you're saying. If he wants you to go to this place with him, what about a divorce? He's given me my choice. I must either go to Meitanfu or else he'll bring an action. Oh, I see. Townsend's tone changed ever so slightly. I think that's rather decent of him, don't you? Decent? Well, it's a damned sporting thing of him to go there. It's not a thing I'd fancy. 
Of course he'll get a CMG for it when he comes back. But me, Charlie, she cried, with anguish in her voice. Well, I think if he wants you to go. Under the circumstances, I don't see how you can very well refuse. It means death. Absolutely certain death. Oh, damn it all, that's rather an exaggeration. He would hardly take you if he thought that. It's no more risk for you than for him. In point of fact, there's no great risk if you're careful. I've been here when there's been cholera and I haven't turned a hair. The great thing is not to eat anything uncooked, no raw fruit or salads, or anything like that. And see that your drinking water is boiled. He was gaining confidence as he proceeded, and his speech was fluent, he was even becoming less sullen and more alert, he was almost breezy. After all, it's his job, isn't it? He's interested in bugs. It's rather a chance for him if you come to think of it. But me, Charlie, she repeated, not with anguish now, but with consternation. Well? The best way to understand a man is to put yourself in his shoes. From his point of view you've been rather a naughty little thing, and he wants to get you out of harm's way. I always thought he never wanted to divorce you, he doesn't strike me as that sort of chap, but he made what he thought was a very generous offer and you put his back up by turning it down. I don't want to blame you, but really for all our sakes I think you ought to have given it a little consideration. But don't you see it'll kill me? Don't you know that he's taking me there because he underscore knows underscore it'll kill me? Oh, my dear, don't talk like that. We're in a damned awkward position, and really it's no time to be melodramatic. You've made up your mind not to understand. Oh, the pain in her heart, and the fear. She could have screamed. You can't send me to certain death. If you have no love or pity for me, you must have just ordinary human feeling. I think it's rather hard on me to put it like that. As far as I can make out your husband is behaving very generously. He's willing to forgive you if you'll let him. He wants to get you away and this opportunity has presented itself to take you to some place where for a few months you'll be out of harm's way. I don't pretend that Mei Tanfu is a health resort, I never knew a Chinese city that was, but there's no reason to get the wind up about it. In fact that's the worst thing you can do. I believe as many people die from sheer fright in an epidemic as because they get infected. But I'm frightened now. When Walter spoke of it I almost fainted. At the first moment I can quite believe it was a shock, but when you come to look at it calmly you'll be all right. It'll be the sort of experience that not everyone has had. I thought, I thought. She rocked to and fro in an agony. He did not speak, and once more his face wore that sullen look which till lately she had never known. Kitty was not crying now. She was dry-eyed, calm. And though her voice was low it was steady. Do you want me to go? It's Hobson's choice, isn't it? Is it? It's only fair to you to tell you that if your husband brought an action for divorce and won it I should not be in a position to marry you. It must have seemed an age to him before she answered. She rose slowly to her feet. I don't think that my husband ever thought of bringing an action. Then why in God's name have you been frightening me out of my wits? 
he asked. She looked at him coolly. He knew that you'd let me down. She was silent. Vaguely. As when you are studying a foreign language and read a page which at first you can make nothing of, till a word or a sentence gives you a clue, and on a sudden a suspicion, as it were, of the sense flashes across your troubled wits, vaguely she gained an inkling into the workings of Walter's mind. It was like a dark and ominous landscape seen by a flash of lightning and in a moment hidden again by the night. She shuddered at what she saw. He made that threat only because he knew that you'd crumple up at it, Charlie. It's strange that he should have judged you so accurately. It was just like him to expose me to such a cruel dissolution. Charlie looked down at the sheet of blotting paper in front of him. He was frowning a little and his mouth was sulky. But he did not reply. He knew that you were vain, cowardly, and self-seeking. He wanted me to see it with my own eyes. He knew that you'd run like a hare at the approach of danger. He knew how grossly deceived I was in thinking that you were in love with me, because he knew that you were incapable of loving anyone but yourself. He knew you'd sacrifice me without a pang to save your own skin. If it really gives you any satisfaction to say beastly things to me I suppose I've got no right to complain. Women always are unfair, and they generally manage to put a man in the wrong. But there is something to be said on the other side. She took no notice of his interruption. And now I know all that he knew. I know that you're callous and heartless. I know that you're selfish, selfish beyond words, and I know that you haven't the nerve of a rabbit. I know you're a liar and a humbug, I know that you're utterly contemptible. And the tragic part is her face was on a sudden distraught with pain. The tragic part is that notwithstanding I love you with all my heart. Kitty. She gave a bitter laugh. He had spoken her name in that melting rich tone of his which came to him so naturally and meant so little. You fool, she said. He drew back quickly, flushing and offended, he could not make her out. She gave him a look in which there was a glint of amusement. You're beginning to dislike me, aren't you? Well, dislike me. It doesn't make any difference to me now. She began to put on her gloves. What are you going to do? he asked. Oh, don't be afraid, you'll come to no harm. You'll be quite safe. For God's sake, don't talk like that, Kitty, he answered and his deep voice rang with anxiety. You must know that everything that concerns you concerns me. I shall be frightfully anxious to know what happens. What are you going to say to your husband? I'm going to tell him that I'm prepared to go to Meitanfu with him. Perhaps when you consent he won't insist. He could not have known why, when he said this, she looked at him so strangely. You're not really frightened, he asked her. No, she said. You've inspired me with courage. To go into the midst of a cholera epidemic will be a unique experience, and if I die of it well, I die. I was trying to be as kind to you as I could. She looked at him again. Tears sprang into her eyes once more and her heart was very full. The impulse was almost irresistible to fling herself on his breast and crush her lips against his. It was no use. If you want to know, she said, 
trying to keep her voice steady. I go with death in my heart and fear. I do not know what Walter has in that dark, twisted mind of his, but I'm shaking with terror. I think it may be that death will be really a release. She felt that she could not hold on to her self-control for another moment. She walked swiftly to the door and let herself out before he had time to move from his chair. Townsend gave a long sigh of relief. He badly wanted a brandy and soda, underscore 27 underscore Walter was in when she got home. She would have liked to go straight to her room, but he was downstairs. In the hall, giving instructions to one of the boys. She was so wretched that she welcomed the humiliation to which she must expose herself. She stopped and faced him. I'm coming with you to that place, she said. Oh, good. When do you want me to be ready? Tomorrow night. She did not know what spirit of bravado entered into her. His indifference was like the prick of a spear. She said a thing that surprised herself. I suppose I needn't take more than a few summer things and a shroud, need I? She was watching his face and knew that her flippancy angered him. I've already told your Amma what you'll want. She nodded and went up to her room. She was very pale, underscore 28 underscore. They were reaching their destination at last. They were born in chairs, day after day, along a narrow causeway between interminable rice fields. They set out at dawn and traveled till the heat of the day forced them to take shelter in a wayside inn and then went on again till they reached the town where they had arranged to spend the night. Kitty's chair headed the procession and Walter followed her. Then in a straggling line came the coolies that bore their bedding, stores and equipment. Kitty passed through the country with unseeing eyes. All through the long hours, the silence broken only by an occasional remark from one of the bearers or a snatch of uncouth song. She turned over in her tortured mind the details of that heartrending scene in Charlie's office. Recalling what he had said to her and what she had said to him. She was dismayed to see what an arid and businesslike turn their conversation had taken. She had not said what she wanted to say and she had not spoken in the tone she intended. Had she been able to make him see her boundless love, the passion in her heart, and her helplessness, he could never have been so inhuman as to leave her to her fate. She had been taken unawares. She could hardly believe her ears when he told her, more clearly than with words, that he cared nothing for her. That was why she had not even cried very much. She had been so dazed. She had wept since, wept miserably. At night in the inns, sharing the principal guest chamber with her husband and conscious that Walter, lying on his camp bed. A few feet away from her, lay awake, she dug her teeth in the pillow so that no sound might escape her. But in the daytime, protected by the curtains of her chair, she allowed herself to give way. Her pain was so great that she could have screamed at the top of her voice. She had never known that one could suffer so much. And she asked herself desperately what she had done to deserve it. She could not make out why Charlie did not love her. It was her fault, she supposed. But she had done everything she knew to make him fond of her. They had always got on so well. They laughed all the time they were together. They were not only lovers, but good friends. She could not understand. She was broken. 
She told herself that she hated and despised him, but she had no idea how she was going to live if she was never to see him again. If Walter was taking her to Mei Tanfu as a punishment he was making a fool of himself, for what did she care now what became of her? She had nothing to live for anymore. It was rather hard to be finished with life at 27, underscore 29 underscore on the steamer that took them up the western river Walter read incessantly. But at mealtimes he endeavored to make some kind of conversation. He talked to her as though she were a stranger with whom he happened to be making the journey of indifferent things. From politeness, Kitty imagined, or because so he could render more marked the gulf that separated them. In a flash of insight she had told Charlie that Walter had sent her to him with the threat of divorce as the alternative to her accompanying him to the stricken city, in order that she might see for herself how indifferent, cowardly and selfish he was. It was true. It was a trick which accorded very well with his sardonic humor. He knew exactly what would happen and he had given her Emma necessary instructions before her return. She had caught in his eyes a disdain which seemed to include her lover as well as herself. He said to himself, perhaps, that if he had been in Townsend's place nothing in the world would have hindered him from making any sacrifice to gratify her smallest whim. She knew that was true also. But then, when her eyes were opened, how could he make her do something which was so dangerous, and which he must know frightened her so terribly? At first she thought he was only playing with her until they actually started, no, later, till they left the river and took to the chairs for the journey across country. She thought he would give that little laugh of his and tell her that she need not come. She had no inkling what was in his mind. He could not really desire her death. He had loved her so desperately. She knew what love was now and she remembered a thousand signs of his adoration. For him really, in the French phrase, she did make fine weather and foul. It was impossible that he did not love her still. Did you cease to love a person because you had been treated cruelly? She had not made him suffer as Charlie had made her suffer and yet, if Charlie made a sign, notwithstanding everything, even though she knew him now, she would abandon all the world had to offer and fly to his arms. Even though he had sacrificed her and cared nothing for her, even though he was callous and unkind, she loved him. At first she thought that she had only to bide her time, and sooner or later Walter would forgive her. She had been too confident of her power over him to believe that it was gone forever. Many waters could not quench love. He was weak if he loved her, and she felt that love her he must. But now she was not quite sure. When in the evening he sat reading in the straight-backed blackwood chair of the inn with the light of a hurricane lamp on his face she was able to watch him at her ease. She lay on the pallet on which her bed presently would be set and she was in shadow. Those straight, regular features of his made his face look very severe. You could hardly believe that it was possible for them on occasion to be changed by so sweet a smile. He was able to read as calmly as though she were a thousand miles away. She saw him turn the pages and she saw his eyes move regularly as they traveled from line to line. He was not thinking of her. And when, the table being set and dinner brought in, he put aside his book and gave her a glance, 
Not knowing how the light on his face threw into distinctness his expression, she was startled to see in his eyes a look of physical distaste. Yes, it startled her. Was it possible that his love had left him entirely? Was it possible that he really designed her death? It was absurd. That would be the act of a madman. It was odd. The little shiver that ran through her as the thought occurred to her that perhaps Walter was not quite sane, underscore triple X underscore suddenly her bearers, long silent, began to speak in one of them. Turning round, with words she could not understand and with a gesture, sought to attract her attention. She looked in the direction he pointed and there, on the top of a hill, saw an archway, she knew by now that it was a memorial in compliment of a fortunate scholar or a virtuous widow, she had passed many of them since they left the river, but this one, silhouetted against the westering sun, was more fantastic and beautiful than any she had seen. Yet, she knew not why, it made her uneasy. It had a significance which she felt but could not put into words. Was it a menace that she vaguely discerned or was it derision? She was passing a grove of bamboos and they leaned over the causeway strangely as if they would detain her. Though the summer evening was windless their narrow green leaves shivered a little. It gave her the sensation that someone hidden among them was watching her as she passed. Now they came to the foot of the hill, and the rice field ceased. The bearers took it with a swinging stride. The hill was covered close with little green mounds, close, close to one another, so that the ground was ribbed like the sea sand when the tide has gone out, and this she knew too. For she had passed just such a spot as they approached each populous city and left it. It was the graveyard. Now she knew why the bearers had called her attention to the archway that stood on the crest of the hill. They had reached the end of their journey. They passed through the archway and the chair bearers paused to change the pole from shoulder to shoulder. One of them wiped his sweating face with a dirty rag. The causeway wound down. There were bedraggled houses on each side. Now the night was falling. But the bearers on a sudden broke into excited talk and with a jump that shook her ranged themselves as near as they could to the wall. In a moment she knew what had startled them. For as they stood there, chattering to one another, for peasants passed, quick and silent, bearing a new coffin, unpainted, and its fresh wood gleamed white in the approaching darkness. Kitty felt her heart beat in terror against her ribs. The coffin passed, but the bearers stood still. It seemed as though they could not summon up the will to go on. But there was a shout from behind, and they started. They did not speak now. They walked for a few minutes longer and then turned sharply into an open gateway. The chair was set down. She had arrived, underscore 31 underscore it was a bungalow, and she entered the sitting room. She sat down while the coolies, straggling in one by one, brought in their loads. Walter in the courtyard gave directions where this or that was to be placed. She was very tired. She was startled to hear an unknown voice. May I come in? She flushed and grew pale. She was overwrought and it made her nervous to meet a stranger. A man came out of the darkness for the long low room was lit only by a shaded lamp, and held out his hand. My name is Waddington. I am the deputy commissioner. 
Oh, the customs. I know. I heard that you were here. In that dim light she could see only that he was a little thin man, no taller than she. With a bald head and a small, bare face. I live just at the bottom of the hill, but coming in this way you wouldn't have seen my house. I thought you'd be too faggy to come and dine with me. So I've ordered your dinner here and I've invited myself. I'm delighted to hear it. You'll find the cooks not bad. I kept on Watson's boys for you. Watson was the missionary who was here. Yes. Very nice fellow. I'll show you his grave tomorrow if you like. How kind you are, said Kitty, with a smile. At that moment Walter came in. Waddington had introduced himself to him before coming in to see Kitty and now he said, I've just been breaking it to your missus that I'm dining with you. Since Watson died I haven't had anybody much to talk to but the nuns, and I can never do myself justice in French. Besides, there is only a limited number of subjects you can talk to them about. I've just told the boy to bring in some drinks, said Walter. The servant brought whiskey and soda and Kitty noticed that Waddington helped himself generously. His manner of speaking and his easy chuckle had suggested to her when he came in that he was not quite sober. Here's luck, he said. Then, turning to Walter. You've got your work cut out for you here. They're dying like flies. The magistrates lost his head and Colonel Yu, the officer commanding the troops, is having a devil of a job to prevent them from looting. If something doesn't happen soon we shall all be murdered in our beds. I tried to get the nuns to go, but of course they wouldn't. They all want to be martyrs, damn them. He spoke lightly and there was in his voice a sort of ghostly laughter so that you could not listen to him without smiling. Why haven't you gone? Asked Walter. Well, I've lost half my staff and the others are ready to lie down and die at any minute. Somebody's got to stay and keep things together. Have you been inoculated? Yes. Watson did me. But he did himself too, and it didn't do him much good, poor blighter. He turned to Kitty and his funny little face was gaily puckered. I don't think there's any great risk if you take proper precautions. Have your milk and water boiled and don't eat fresh fruit or uncooked vegetables. Have you brought any gramophone records with you? No, I don't think so, said Kitty. I'm sorry for that. I was hoping you would. I haven't had any for a long time, and I'm sick of my old ones. The boy came in to ask if they would have dinner. You won't dress tonight, will you? asked Waddington. My boy died last week and the boy I have now is a fool. So I haven't been dressing in the evening. I'll go and take off my hat, said Kitty. Her room was next door to that in which they sat. It was barely furnished. And Emma was kneeling on the floor. The lamp beside her, unpacking Kitty's things, Underscore 32 underscore the dining room was small and the greater part of it was filled by an immense table. On the walls were engravings of scenes from the Bible and illuminated texts. Missionaries always have large dining tables, Waddington explained. 
They get so much a year more for every child they have and they buy their tables when they marry so that there shall be plenty of room for little strangers. From the ceiling hung a large paraffin lamp, so that Kitty was able to see better what sort of a man Waddington was. His baldness had deceived her into thinking him no longer young. But she saw now that he must be well under forty. His face, small under a high, rounded forehead, was unlined and fresh-colored, it was ugly like a monkey's. But with an ugliness that was not without charm, it was an amusing face. His features, his nose and his mouth, were hardly larger than a child's, and he had small, very bright blue eyes. His eyebrows were fair and scanty. He looked like a funny little old boy. He helped himself constantly to liquor and as dinner proceeded it became evident that he was far from sober. But if he was drunk it was without offensiveness, gaily, as a satyr might be who had stolen a wineskin from a sleeping shepherd. He talked of Ching Yin. He had many friends there and he wanted to know about them. He had been down for the races a year before and he talked of ponies and their owners. By the way, what about Townsend? He asked suddenly. Is he going to become colonial secretary? Kitty felt herself flush, but her husband did not look at her. I shouldn't wonder, he answered. He's the sort that gets on. Do you know him? asked Walter. Yes, I know him pretty well. We traveled out from home together once. From the other side of the river they heard the beating of gongs and the clatter of firecrackers. There, so short away from them, the great city lay in terror and death. Sudden and ruthless, hurried through its tortuous streets. But Waddington began to speak of London. He talked of the theaters. He knew everything that was being played at the moment, and he told them what pieces he had seen when he was last home on leave. He laughed as he recollected the humor of this low comedian and sighed as he reflected on the beauty of that star of musical comedy. He was pleased to be able to boast that a cousin of his had married one of the most celebrated. He had lunched with her and she had given him her photograph. He would show it to them when they came and dined with him at the customs. Walter looked at his guest with a cold and ironic gaze, but he was evidently not a little amused by him and he made an effort to show a civil interest in topics of which Kitty was well aware he knew nothing. A faint smile lingered on his lips. But Kitty, she knew not why, was filled with awe. In the house of that dead missionary, over against the stricken city, they seemed immeasurably apart from all the world. Three solitary creatures and strangers to each other. Dinner was finished, and she rose from the table. Do you mind if I say good night to you? I'm going to bed. I'll take myself off. I expect the doctor wants to go to bed, too, answered Waddington. We must be out early tomorrow. He shook hands with Kitty. He was quite steady on his feet, but his eyes were shining more than ever. I'll come and fetch you, he told Walter, and take you to see the magistrate and colonel you, and then we'll go along to the convent. You've got your work cut out, I can tell you. Underscore 33 underscore her night was tortured with strange dreams. She seemed to be carried in her chair and she felt the swaying motion as the bearers marched with their long, uneven stride. She entered cities, vast and dim. 
where the multitude thronged about her with curious eyes. The streets were narrow and tortuous and in the open shops, with their strange wares, all traffic stopped as she went by and those who bought and those who sold, paused. Then she came to the memorial arch and its fantastic outline seemed on a sudden to gain a monstrous life. Its capricious contours were like the waving arms of a Hindu god, and, as she passed under it, she heard the echo of mocking laughter. But then Charlie Townsend came towards her and took her in his arms, lifting her out of the chair, and said it was all a mistake, he had never meant to treat her as he had, for he loved her and he couldn't live without her. She felt his kisses on her mouth, and she wept with joy, asking him why he had been so cruel, but though she asked she knew it did not matter. And then there was a hoarse, abrupt cry and they were separated and between, hurrying silently. Coolies passed in their ragged blue and they bore a coffin. She awoke with a start. The bungalow stood halfway down a steep hill and from her window she saw the narrow river below her and opposite, the city. The dawn had just broken and from the river rose a white mist shrouding the junks that lay moored close to one another like peas in a pod. There were hundreds of them, and they were silent, mysterious in that ghostly light, and you had a feeling that their crews lay under an enchantment, for it seemed that it was not sleep, but something strange and terrible that held them so still and mute. The morning drew on and the sun touched the mist so that it shone whitely like the ghost of snow on a dying star. Though on the river it was light so that you could discern palely the lines of the crowded junks and the thick forest of their masts. In front it was a shining wall the eye could not pierce. But suddenly from that white cloud a tall, grim and massive bastion emerged. It seemed not merely to be made visible by the all-discovering sun, but rather to rise out of nothing at the touch of a magic wand. It towered, the stronghold of a cruel and barbaric race, over the river. But the magician who built worked swiftly and now a fragment of colored wall crowned the bastion. In a moment, out of the mist, looming vastly and touched here and there by a yellow ray of sun, there was seen a cluster of green and yellow roofs. Huge they seemed and you could make out no pattern, the order. If order there was, escaped you, wayward and extravagant, but of an unimaginable richness. This was no fortress, nor a temple but the magic palace of some emperor of the gods where no man might enter. It was too airy, fantastic, and unsubstantial to be the work of human hands. It was the fabric of a dream. The tears ran down Kitty's face and she gazed, her hands clasped to her breast and her mouth, for she was breathless, open a little. She had never felt so light of heart and it seemed to her as though her body were a shell that lay at her feet and she pure spirit. Here was beauty. She took it as the believer takes in his mouth the wafer which is God, underscore 34 underscore since Walter went out early in the morning, came back at Tiffin only for half an hour, and did not then return till dinner was just ready. Kitty found herself much alone. For some days, she did not stir from the bungalow. It was very hot, and for the most part she lay in a long chair by the open window, trying to read. The hard light of midday had robbed the magic palace of its mystery, and now it was no more than a temple on the city wall, garish and shabby. 
but because she had seen it once in such an ecstasy it was never again quite commonplace, and often at dawn or at dusk, and again at night. She found herself able to recapture something of that beauty. What had seemed to her a mighty bastion was, but the city wall, and on this, massive and dark, her eyes rested continually. Behind its crenellations lay the city in the dread grip of the pestilence. Vaguely she knew that terrible things were happening there, not from Walter who when she questioned him. For otherwise he rarely spoke to her, answered with a humorous nonchalance which sent a shiver down her spine, but from Waddington and from the Amma. The people were dying at the rate of a hundred a day and hardly any of those who were attacked by the disease recovered from it. The gods had been brought out from the abandoned temples and placed in the streets, offerings were laid before them and sacrifices made, but they did not stay the plague. The people died so fast that it was hardly possible to bury them. In some houses the whole family had been swept away and there was none to perform the funeral rites. The officer commanding the troops was a masterful man and if the city was not given over to riot and arson it was due to his determination. He forced his soldiers to bury such as there was no one else to bury and he had shot with his own hand an officer who demurred at entering a stricken house. Kitty sometimes was so frightened that her heart sank within her and she would tremble in every limb. It was very well to say that the risk was small if you took reasonable precautions. She was panic-stricken. She turned over in her mind crazy plans of escape. To get away, just to get away, she was prepared to set out as she was and make her way alone without anything but what she stood up in, to some place of safety. She thought of throwing herself on the mercy of Waddington, telling him everything and beseeching him to help her to get back to Ching Yen. If she flung herself on her knees before her husband and admitted that she was frightened, frightened, even though he hated her now, he must have enough human feeling in him to pity her. It was out of the question. If she went, where could she go? Not to her mother. Her mother would make her see very plainly that, having married her off, she counted on being rid of her, and besides she did not want to go to her mother. She wanted to go to Charlie and he did not want her. She knew what he would say if she suddenly appeared before him. She saw the sullen look of his face and the shrewd hardness behind his charming eyes. It would be difficult for him to find words that sounded well. She clenched her hands. She would have given anything to humiliate him as he had humiliated her. Sometimes she was seized with such a frenzy that she wished she had let Walter divorce her, ruining herself if only she could have ruined him too. Certain things he had said to her made her blush with shame when she recalled them, underscore 35 underscore the first time she was alone with Waddington she brought the conversation round to Charlie. Waddington had spoken of him on the evening of their arrival. She pretended that he was no more than an acquaintance of her husband. I never much cared for him, said Waddington. I've always thought him a bore. You must be very hard to please, returned Kitty, in the bright, chaffing way she could assume so easily. I suppose he's far and away the most popular man in Qingyan. I know. That is his stock in trade. He's made a science of popularity. 
He has the gift of making everyone he meets feel that he is the one person in the world he wants to see. He's always ready to do a service that isn't any trouble to himself. And even if he doesn't do what you want he manages to give you the impression that it's only because it's not humanly possible. That is surely an attractive trait. Charm in nothing, but charm at last, grows a little tiresome, I think. It's a relief then to deal with a man who isn't quite so delightful, but a little more sincere. I've known Charlie Townsend for a good many years and once or twice I've caught him with the mask off you see, I never mattered. Just a subordinate official in the customs and I know that he doesn't in his heart give a damn for anyone in the world but himself. Kitty, lounging easily in her chair, looked at him with smiling eyes. She turned her wedding ring round and round her finger. Of course he'll get on. He knows all the official ropes. Before I die I have every belief that I shall address him as Your Excellency and stand up when he enters the room. Most people think he deserves to get on. He's generally supposed to have a great deal of ability. Ability? What nonsense! He's a very stupid man. He gives you the impression that he dashes off his work and gets it through from sheer brilliancy. Nothing of the kind. He's as industrious as a Eurasian clerk. How has he got the reputation of being so clever? There are many foolish people in the world and when a man in a rather high position puts on no frills, slaps them on the back and tells them he'll do anything in the world for them, they are very likely to think him clever. And then of course, there's his wife. There's an able woman if you like. She has a good sound head and her advice is always worth taking. As long as Charlie Townsend's got her to depend on he's pretty safe never to do a foolish thing. And that's the first thing necessary for a man to get on in government service. They don't want clever men, clever men have ideas, and ideas cause trouble. They want men who have charm and tact and who can be counted on never to make a blunder. Oh, yes, Charlie Townsend will get to the top of the tree all right. I wonder why you dislike him. I don't dislike him. But you like his wife better, smiled Kitty. I'm an old-fashioned little man and I like a well-bred woman. I wish she were well-dressed as well as well-bred. Doesn't she dress well? I never noticed. I've always heard that they were a devoted couple, said Kitty, watching him through her eyelashes. He's very fond of her, I will give him that credit. I think that is the most decent thing about him. Cold praise. He has his little flirtations, but they're not serious. He's much too cunning to let them go to such lengths as might cause him inconvenience. And of course he isn't a passionate man, he's only a vain one. He likes admiration. He's fat and forty now. He does himself too well, but he was very good-looking when he first came to the colony. I've often heard his wife chaff him about his conquests. She doesn't take his flirtations very seriously? Oh, no, she knows they don't go very far. She says she'd like to be able to make friends of the poor little things who fall to Charlie. But they're always so common. She says it's really not very flattering to her that the women who fall in love with her husband are so uncommonly second-rate. 
underscore 36 underscore. When Waddington left her kitty thought over what he had so carelessly said. It hadn't been very pleasant to hear, and she had had to make something of an effort not to show how much it touched her. It was bitter to think that all he said was true. She knew that Charlie was stupid and vain, hungry for flattery, and she remembered the complacency with which he had told her little stories to prove his cleverness. He was proud of a low cunning. How worthless must she be if she had given her heart so passionately to such a man because because he had nice eyes and a good figure. She wished to despise him, because so long as she only hated him she knew that she was very near loving him. The way he had treated her should have opened her eyes. Walter had always held him in contempt. Oh! if she could only get him out of her mind altogether. And had his wife chaffed him about her obvious infatuation for him? Dorothy would have liked to make a friend of her, but that she found her second-rate. Kitty smiled a little. How indignant her mother would be to know that her daughter was considered that. But at night she dreamt of him again. She felt his arms pressing her close and the hot passion of his kisses on her lips. What did it matter if he was fat and forty? She laughed with soft affection because he minded so much. She loved him all the more for his childlike vanity and she could be sorry for him and comfort him. When she awoke tears were streaming from her eyes. She did not know why it seemed to her so tragic to cry in her sleep. Underscore 37 underscore she saw Waddington every day, for he strolled up the hill to the Fane's bungalow when his day's work was done. And so after a week they had arrived at an intimacy which under other circumstances they could scarcely have achieved in a year. Once when Kitty told him she didn't know what she would do there without him he answered, laughing, you see. You and I are the only people here who walk quite quietly and peaceably on solid ground. The nuns walk in heaven and your husband in darkness. Though she gave a careless laugh she wondered what he meant. She felt that his merry little blue eyes were scanning her face with an amiable, but disconcerting attention. She had discovered already that he was shrewd and she had a feeling that the relations between herself and Walter excited his cynical curiosity. She found a certain amusement in baffling him. She liked him and she knew that he was kindly disposed towards her. He was not witty nor brilliant. But he had a dry and incisive way of putting things which was diverting, and his funny, boyish face under that bald skull, all screwed up with laughter, made his remarks sometimes extremely droll. He had lived for many years in outports, often with no man of his own color to talk to and his personality had developed in eccentric freedom. He was full of fads and oddities. His frankness was refreshing. He seemed to look upon life in a spirit of banter. And his ridicule of the colony at Qingyan was acid, but he laughed also at the Chinese officials in Meitanfu and at the cholera which decimated the city. He could not tell a tragic story or one of heroism without making it faintly absurd. He had many anecdotes of his adventures during twenty years in China. And you concluded from them that the earth was a very grotesque, bizarre, and ludicrous place. Though he denied that he was a Chinese scholar. He swore that the Sinologues were as mad as March hares. He spoke the language with ease. He read little and what he knew he had learned from conversation. 
but he often told kiddie stories from the Chinese novels and from Chinese history, and though he told them with that airy badinage which was natural to him it was good-humored and even tender. It seemed to her that, perhaps unconsciously, he had adopted the Chinese view that the Europeans were barbarians and their life a folly. In China alone was it so led that a sensible man might discern in it a sort of reality. Here was food for reflection. Kitty had never heard the Chinese spoken of as anything but decadent, dirty and unspeakable. It was as though the corner of a curtain were lifted for a moment, and she caught a glimpse of a world rich with a color and significance she had not dreamt of. He sat there, talking, laughing and drinking. Don't you think you drink too much, said Kitty to him boldly. It's my great pleasure in life, he answered. Besides, it keeps the cholera out. When he left her he was generally drunk, but he carried his liquor well. It made him hilarious, but not disagreeable. One evening Walter, coming back earlier than usual, asked him to stay to dinner. A curious incident happened. They had their soup and their fish and then with the chicken a fresh green salad was handed to Kitty by the boy. Good God! You're not going to eat that, cried Waddington, as he saw Kitty take some. Yes, we have it every night. My wife likes it, said Walter. The dish was handed to Waddington, but he shook his head. Thank you very much, but I'm not thinking of committing suicide just yet. Walter smiled grimly and helped himself. Waddington said nothing more. In fact, he became strangely taciturn. And soon after dinner, he left them. It was true that they ate salad every night. Two days after their arrival, the cook, with the unconcern of the Chinese, had sent it in and Kitty, without thinking, took some. Walter leaned forward quickly. You oughtn't to eat that. The boy's crazy to serve it. Why not? asked Kitty, looking at him full in the face. It's always dangerous. It's madness now. You'll kill yourself. I thought that was the idea, said Kitty. She began to eat it coolly. She was seized with she knew not what spirit of bravado. She watched Walter with mocking eyes. She thought that he grew a trifle pale, but when the salad was handed to him he helped himself. The cook, finding they did not refuse it, sent them some in every day and every day, courting death, they ate it. It was grotesque to take such a risk. Kitty, in terror of the disease, took it with the feeling not only that she was thus maliciously avenging herself on Walter, but that she was flouting her own desperate fears, underscore 38 underscore. It was the day after this that Waddington, coming to the bungalow in the afternoon, when he had sat a little asked Kitty if she would not go for a stroll with him. She had not been out of the compound since her arrival. She was glad enough. There are not many walks, I'm afraid, he said. But we'll go to the top of the hill. Oh, yes, where the archway is. I've seen it often from the terrace. One of the boys opened the heavy doorway for them and they stepped out into the dusty lane. They walked a few yards and then Kitty seizing Waddington's arm in fright, gave a startled cry. Look! What's the matter? 
At the foot of the wall that surrounded the compound, a man lay on his back with his legs stretched out and his arms thrown over his head. He wore the patched blue rags and the wild mop of hair of the Chinese beggar. He looks as if he were dead, Kitty gasped. He is dead. Come along, you'd better look the other way. I'll have him moved when we come back. But Kitty was trembling so violently that she could not stir. I've never seen anyone dead before. You'd better hurry up and get used to it then. Because you'll see a good many before you've done with this cheerful spot. He took her hand and drew it in his arm. They walked for a little in silence. Did he die of cholera? She said at last. I suppose so. They walked up the hill till they came to the archway. It was richly carved. Fantastic and ironical it stood like a landmark in the surrounding country. They sat down on the pedestal and faced the wide plain. The hill was sown close with the little green mounds of the dead, not in lines but disorderly. So that you felt that beneath the surface they must strangely jostle one another. The narrow causeway meandered sinuously among the green rice fields. A small boy seated on the neck of a water buffalo drove it slowly home, and three peasants in wide straw hats lolloped with sidelong gait under their heavy loads. After the heat of the day it was pleasant in that spot to catch the faint breeze of the evening and the wide expanse of country brought a sense of restful melancholy to the tortured heart. But Kitty could not rid her mind of the dead beggar. How can you talk and laugh and drink whiskey when people are dying all around you? she asked suddenly. Waddington did not answer. He turned round and looked at her, then he put his hand on her arm. You know, this is no place for a woman, he said gravely. Why don't you go? She gave him a sidelong glance from beneath her long lashes and there was the shadow of a smile on her lips. I should have thought under the circumstances a wife's place was by her husband's side. When they telegraphed to me that you were coming with Fane, I was astonished. But then it occurred to me that perhaps you'd been a nurse and all this sort of thing was in the day's work. I expected you to be one of those grim-visaged females who lead you a dog's life when you're ill in hospital. You could have knocked me down with a feather when I came into the bungalow and saw you sitting down and resting. You looked very frail and white and tired. You couldn't expect me to look my best after nine days on the road. You look frail and white and tired now, and if you'll allow me to say so, desperately unhappy. Kitty flushed because she could not help it, but she was able to give a laugh that sounded merry enough. I'm sorry you don't like my expression. The only reason I have for looking unhappy is that since I was twelve I've known that my nose was a little too long. But to cherish a secret sorrow is a most effective pose. You can't think how many sweet young men have wanted to console me. Waddington's blue and shining eyes rested on her and she knew that he did not believe a word she said. She did not care so long as he pretended to. I knew that you hadn't been married very long, and I came to the conclusion that you and your husband were madly in love with each other. I couldn't believe that he had wished you to come, but perhaps you had absolutely refused to stay behind. That's a very reasonable explanation, she said lightly. Yes but it isn't the right one. She waited for him to go on, 
fearful of what he was about to say for she had a pretty good idea of his shrewdness and was aware that he never hesitated to speak his mind, but unable to resist the desire to hear him talk about herself. I don't think for a moment that you're in love with your husband. I think you dislike him, I shouldn't be surprised if you hated him. But I'm quite sure you're afraid of him. For a moment she looked away. She did not mean to let Waddington see that anything he said affected her. I have a suspicion that you don't very much like my husband, she said with cool irony. I respect him. He has brains and character, and that, I may tell you, is a very unusual combination. I don't suppose you know what he is doing here because I don't think he's very expansive with you. If any man single-handed can put a stop to this frightful epidemic he's going to do it. He's doctoring the sick, cleaning the city up, trying to get the drinking water pure. He doesn't mind where he goes nor what he does. He's risking his life 20 times a day. He's got Colonel Yu in his pocket and he's induced him to put the troops at his disposal. He's even put a little pluck into the magistrate and the old man is really trying to do something. And the nuns at the convent swear by him. They think he's a hero. Don't you? After all this isn't his job, is it? He's a bacteriologist. There was no call for him to come here. He doesn't give me the impression that he's moved by compassion for all these dying Chinamen. Watson was different. He loved the human race. Though he was a missionary it didn't make any difference to him if they were Christian, Buddhist or Confucian, they were just human beings. Your husband isn't here because he cares a damn if a hundred thousand Chinese die of cholera. He isn't here either in the interests of science. Why is he here? You better ask him. It interests me to see you together. I sometimes wonder how you behave when you're alone. When I'm there you're acting, both of you, and acting damned badly, by George. You'd neither of you get 30 bob a week in a touring company, if that's the best you can do. I don't know what you mean, smiled Kitty. Keeping up a pretense of frivolity which she knew did not deceive. You're a very pretty woman. It's funny that your husband should never look at you. When he speaks to you it sounds as though it were not his voice, but somebody else's. Do you think he doesn't love me? asked Kitty in a low voice, hoarsely. Putting aside suddenly her lightness. I don't know. I don't know if you fill him with such a repulsion that it gives him goose flesh to be near you or if he's burning with a love that, for some reason he will not allow himself to show. I've asked myself if you're both here to commit suicide. Kitty had seen the startled glance and then the scrutinizing look Waddington gave them when the incident of the salad took place. I think you're attaching too much importance to a few lettuce leaves, she said flippantly. She rose. Shall we go home? I'm sure you want a whiskey and soda. You're not a heroine at all events. You're frightened to death. Are you sure you don't want to go away? What has it got to do with you? I'll help you. R underscore you underscore going to fall to my look of secret sorrow? Look at my profile and tell me if my nose isn't a trifle too long. He gazed at her reflectively, that malicious, ironical look in his bright eyes, but mingled with it, 
a shadow. Like a tree standing at a river's edge and its reflection in the water, was an expression of singular kindliness. It brought sudden tears to Kitty's eyes. Must you stay? Yes. They passed under the flamboyant archway and walked down the hill. When they came to the compound, they saw the body of the dead beggar. He took her arm, but she released herself. She stood still. It's dreadful, isn't it? What? Death. Yes. It makes everything else seem so horribly trivial. He doesn't look human. When you look at him you can hardly persuade yourself that he's ever been alive. It's hard to think that not so very many years ago he was just a little boy tearing down the hill and flying a kite. She could not hold back the sob that choked her, underscore 39 underscore. A few days later Waddington, sitting with Kitty, a long glass of whiskey and soda in his hand, began to speak to her of the convent. The mother superior is a very remarkable woman, he said.